is not a sponsored broadcast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Only if we get sponsored. Brought to you that. by Booger King. <sighs> Brought to you by what? Yes. Boogers. They're in your nose. Oh. So one of my friends just He knows where they are. <laughs> Brought to you by Carl's Jr. DOT. Anyone get that reference? That's yes. Six. Yes, we got the reference, Laura. Oh, hit Thank it. you. Oh, tasty. Okay, yeah. <laughs> That stays up for a little while, yeah. I was going to say, that bridge isn't closing anytime soon. Why do you keep saying that? Dumbass, they pay me money every time. I'll say anything if people will pay me money. <laughs> oh, wait, I'm Jewish. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, in other words. Ah, <laughs> uh, jeez. I would never a... get you to say anything. Oh, it's, another, it's another Saturday night here at uh, the Wiz headquarters. And we once don't a, got no money. We got nothing else to do but to gather together <laughs> here and do another live show, right? Oh. Yeah. So I have my friends with me again tonight. I've got Anthony from Connecticut. I've got, for some reason, Steve is here. I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> um, Erica's here. Hello. And Laura's somewhere on Skype, I think. I am calling in from home from beautiful Hartford County, Maryland. Oh, lovely. Nice to have you with us. Nice to be here. Um, you got to keep your streak alive, I see. Uh, no, there's a family That's family right. Family. That streak is very important. <laughs> <laughs> no streaking. No, so she, you know, she, I, she... I have to emulate my hero, Kowalkin Jr. Yeah, well, he's a fraud, so you don't want to look up to him. Ah, ah, he is not a fraud. Thank you very much. Um. But yeah, no, she was on every show that we did last winter. So she's oh. carrying it over into what we're doing now. So. This winter. In this yeah, well, winter. you know, this year's going by so fast, it'll be next winter before you know it. Mm, I don't yeah. want to be winter. To all of our Australian fans, this is for you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, so tonight's topic is one that is near and dear to me. My day job is civil engineer. And one of the things that I've always wanted to do was take a trip that involved documenting all of the bridges on the Mississippi River, uh, particularly the bridges on the lower Mississippi. Um, And having six weeks off from work this past winter enabled me to do that. Uh, And so I was able to get out there and check out all the bridges between Memphis and uh, New Orleans. And so that's going to be the subject matter uh, of tonight's show. Um, Let me just check before we get going here. I want to actually make sure that this stream is actually working. (laughs) I don't want to be talking. If you can't hear us, give a shout. (laughs) Oh, no, I I see that it says we're live. I just want to double check the... uh, That we live. Well, that and also the... um, the chat. I want to make sure that the chat is working correctly. Uh, Which it looks like it is. Okay. Uh, Yeah, alright. So, um, that is the subject matter of tonight's show. So, glad you're with us for this. This is a show that I really looked forward to putting together for quite some time. And so it's it's good to finally see that it's seeing the light of day. Um... We've got a lot of new content on the Gribble Nation podcast, or Roadcast as we like to call it. If you're not already following our podcast on Spotify, why aren't you? Because we have <laughs> new, a lot of new content out there right now. I have a bunch of new content out recently. I've also got some stuff scheduled for the next uh, four or five weeks, actually. Um, I did a series of episodes with um, my friend Jason, who lives in the New Orleans area, and we spent literally several hours just talking about new orleans roads the city itself and uh, also we shared some of his uh, personal experiences with hurricanes over the years uh, he was kind of in the middle of uh, hurricane katrina um the evacuation of that and then the aftermath of it so one of the episodes that we did that's coming out in june uh is devoted to some of his recollections of that you know katrina was can't believe it's been 18 years 
since oh, that. Oh, wow. Happened. Yeah, 18 years in August. Yeah. It's making me feel really old. I don't like it. I know. Because <laughs> I, I, was, I was starring my senior year of high school when I was watching the wow. CNN coverage of that. And I can't believe that was 18 years ago. If but, you were conceived during Hurricane Katrina, you were legal in many states. <laughs> yeah. In Alabama, you'd already be married with kids. <laughs> So that's what's coming up on the podcast. I know Doug has been active on the blog. He he put up an article on the Roanoke. There's a star on the top of a mountain in Roanoke, and I'm blanking on the name of it for some reason. But there's an article. Mill Mountain that. Star. The what now? The Mill Mountain Star. But that's what it is. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah, so there's that, and then um, I don't know. Tom's probably writing up something about some California state highway. He usually comes out with something on a daily basis. So follow the blog, too, if you haven't already. Um, on YouTube, my channel, it's pretty appropriate that I'm uploading stuff from southeast Louisiana right now. Um, it's kind of unusual that I would go back and just refilm and re-upload a bunch of videos from a single metropolitan area, but that's what I decided to do with the New Orleans metro area. Um so that's what we're doing now, and there will be new content from Southeast Louisiana through, I think, towards the end of next week, I think. And then we'll start to do other parts of the country as well. Um, upcoming road meets, you see them on the screen here. Find a road meet in your neck of the woods, and feel free to attend and join the conversation. and. You get to meet some of your favorite uh, content creators and all that good stuff. There are links to more information on each of the meets you see here in their respective threads on the AA Roads Forum. Uh, some of these events also have Facebook events associated with them, but the best way for you to find those are to f go through the threads for each of these uh, events on the forum itself. I will see all of you at Grand Forks. <laughs> Yeah, there we have not had too many meets in North Dakota over the years, so I'm I'm interested to see how this one goes. It will be great. Are you going? Yes. Nice. Well, it's going to be great because he's going. Exactly. That's why. Yeah, there we go. Yep. Also, take note of the meet at the end of July in Buffalo, New York. That's the one that I'm hosting this year. Woo. Um, that should be a lot of fun. Oh yeah, because I'm going. <laughs> of course, it doesn't matter that I'm doing it. It matters that uh, Steve's going. Clearly, yeah, go and the Empty Roads family plans on attending too, including the day after we plan on taking Maid of the Mist from New York into international Canadian waters to get Rainy her first, or well, really her second, you know, country, U.S. being the first, but her first foreign country. <laughs> sort of, anyway. <laughs> Asterisk. Yeah, that, there's, there's an asterisk on that. Mm. But if we had more time, we would we would explore uh, we would explore uh, Ontario proper. But it, it's it's a good it'll be a good experience that I think four year old Rainy will remember. It will be a, a very good core early memory for her. There's a lot of interesting stuff we're, worth exploring in that part of Ontario. Also, you're not too far from the Welland Canal at that point. Oh yeah, and um, the tunnels they're under. Yeah, the tunnels, the bridges, and then they recently opened up one of the old water tunnels on the Canadian side nice. for tours. So now you can Ooh. do that. Yeah, it's That's associated really with the power plant over there, I think. I saw. Hear more about this on a future Bridges of the St. Lawrence River Railroad. <laughs> Maybe we'll do that someday, yeah. Well, that'd be fun. Bridges of the St. Lawrence Seaway. Live. Um, so for tonight, I have highlighted on this map the... Uh, the legal definition of the Lower Mississippi River, which is where the Ohio River comes in from the northeast and comes down. It be, the Ohio begins in Pittsburgh and makes its way down in a generally west-southwest direction uh, and meets the Upper Mississippi River um, just downstream of the village of Cairo, Illinois. City. Is it a city or a village? Feels like a city to me. Wow. Well, either way. <laughs> the, it feels like it once was a much nicer place. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> If anyone's ever been to Cairo, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, yeah. I, I know what you're talking about, yeah. Um, they, con they come together at a place called Fort Defiance, which was a old fortification going back to, I think, Civil War days, or maybe even earlier than that. Mm -hmm. um, 
So the legal definition is from Fort Defiance to the Gulf of Mexico. There is an alternate definition of the Lower Mississippi River that is more cultural in nature, and this applies to the river that begins in Memphis and makes its way out to the Gulf. And this is, again, a more cultural definition that includes the Mississippi Delta region of the state of Mississippi uh, and also, you know, the geological delta of Louisiana. Everything I've seen from Cairo South suggests that that is the cultural definition that you're showing right now. Well, yeah, and I mean, uh, geologically, that's about the north end of historic Mississippi and Bame, and so south of there, it, it'd be, you know, the topography right. is different. So we're um, going to keep this. You know, well, right, and that, that point is historically significant for other reasons, too. I mean, you know, the Ohio River being the traditional border between north and south in that area... And then also, interesting note here, that uh, hydrologically, the Ohio is actually the main branch. Mm -hmm. uh, more water, uh, on average, comes out of the Ohio River than comes out of the Mississippi north of the Ohio. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yep. I would have figured that with the Missouri com coming and in. And you would figure thing. this, but what you have to realize is that, is that uh, a, a lot of the land that the Missouri flows through is a much drier climate. Mm. So while the Missouri is much longer, it does not pick up nearly as much water along the way. So we're talking, by the way, here in terms of volume of water moving. Yep. Mm. All right. Pittsburgh all flushes their toilets at the same time. <laughs> uh, yeah. For, where, at, at, for all those toilets in Pittsburgh where you can just sit in the middle of the basement and put on a show. <laughs> so for our purposes tonight, we're going to deal with the geological definition of Lower Mississippi, which begins at Fort Defiance. And we have... I'll show you the list of entries that we will be covering tonight real quick. Um, I picked, well, I mean, all of these bridges exist. I've also added, in this case, I've added one bridge that's been proposed for construction in future years. Um, and then moving further down the river into the state of Louisiana, we have these bridges, including another bridge that was planned to be built once upon a time and will likely never see the light of day. But it's interesting from... An engineering perspective and also potentially from a flood control perspective so we'll talk about that uh, I'm towards intrigued. I bet you are yeah. yeah so we'll talk about that as well in uh, good time well let's take off um, as we head down river from Fort Defiance the first bridge we come across is at Caruthersville Missouri it's in Missouri right it is in Missouri um, this bridge carries I-155 and US-412. We don't talk about US-412. We don't like to talk <laughs> about US-412, but we have no choice but to acknowledge it in this particular instance. It is, it is the lone bridge on the river between Cairo and Memphis, which is about 200 river miles. As the crow flies, it's significantly less than that, because you must remember that the Mississippi River takes mm -hmm. quite a windy, curvy path over most of its length, especially down in the Mississippi Delta region. That changes regularly, too. Well, the, 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 the changing of course is another topic that yeah. we will be getting into at some point here. Yeah, that's correct. Are there any bridges that are no longer over river? Um... Not short answer is short answer is no. Not in big ones anyway, because whenever you have an oxbow, it's easier to just have the road go around the oxbow. It'll have to cross mm. a little stream to go around the downstream end of it. But I can think of at least one village I've been to that differs with that. Well, that's the thing is that there there are inhabited places that are uh, clearly that's different river. <laughs> well, that's not <laughs> the, like, the idea, but that's the idea of living in the oxbow. Right, right, right. But, they're, they're right, yeah. they're, they're right. but I know there, there is, for example, a community that is in the state of Illinois, in spite of being west of the Mississippi River, mm -hmm. <laughs> because well, right. the river moved. It was east of the Mississippi. Yeah. And, and, and the important thing to keep in mind here is that the river naturally moves, but the the definition of the state border does not uh, move. It is where the river was when the states were first defined in the mm. you know early to mid nineteenth right. century. Oh, interesting! So, yeah. I didn't realize that. That's that's why you end up with these situations. Yeah, the, the river moves after a big flood. The border don't move. <laughs> right. Yeah, the lead, they didn't write into the legal definition of the state boundaries that the the boundary is where the river is. 
This, so. this cause is even more fun with the Rio Grande because it's been known to do the same thing, and the United States and Mexico have had to figure That's out. That's an international oh, border, yeah. Yep, that whole business. And, 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 and in, that, in, in that case, they, they have actually swapped territory to yep. avoid this problem. Yep. And, and, and in some places, they've actually concrete lined the river to stop it from moving. <laughs> <laughs> this is the border we're not giving land. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so in the case of this particular bridge, a couple of things that are worth mentioning. Um, if you didn't know that southeastern Missouri was earthquake country, well, you do now, because <laughs> this is in the middle of the New Madrid seismic zone, which has only really been active, I think, once in the Recent time that it's history. been set we waiting for by Westerners. Um <laughs> Geological records suggest that the New Magic Seismic Zone will produce large earthquakes greater than 7.0 magnitude every 700 to 1,000 years. And we're overdue. Something like that. No, no. <laughs> there was one in the early 19th century. We are not overdue. That was big enough? Okay. The yeah. 1811 and 1812 earthquakes were estimated to be roughly 8.0 each. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that, that's, yeah. So that's kind of what we're dealing with. The bridges, a lot of the bridges in the metropolitan areas of St. Louis and Memphis have been seismically retrofitted, which mm. is very unusual for being in the middle of America. You wouldn't think that you would need to do that. Um, specifically, the, uh, the I-64 viaduct in downtown St. Louis and also the I-40 bridge over the Mississippi was heavily retrofitted for seismic purposes and for, this, other, and for other is reasons. this one we'll seismic retrofitted yeah. <laughs> um the other thing i want to mention is that you know there are a lot of nitwits and dopes on youtube who put out content um and one video that i saw recently suggested that interstate 155 was one of the most useless interstates in the united states um well, I'd like to try to debunk that by saying what I first said with, about this bridge was that, you know, it's the only bridge for, I mean, if you go by river miles, it's 200 river miles. If you go by, as the crow flies, it's about 125 miles, something like that. Well, it, it was it built as interstate? Or was it built as um, I believe it was. Okay. It was intended to connect the I-55 corridor with, well, what was... Then and still now is the US 51 corridor. It is part of the future I 69 corridor. Not This bridge is not, but part of I 155 would connect to it. Would connect to it. Well, I 155 crosses this bridge. Right. right. Yeah. This, this bridge will not be I 69, is what I'm saying. Though. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, so, for redundancy purposes and for regional connectivity between two north south interstate corridors, I would argue that this bridge is actually very useful. Um, and also the fact that it is the only bridge on the river between two pretty, along a pretty significant distance. There, there is also um, a ferry. Well, there's a ferry, but yes, I mean, but tractor fer- trailers aren't going to go that fer- way. Well, ferries are, <laughs> ferries are slow and of limited capacity, but, there, but there, there is a ferry across the river from Kentucky to Missouri. We should replace all ferries with bridges. And what you're talking about is the Kentucky Bend, right? No, it is not out of the Kentucky Bend. It is not. No, okay. it's out of the main part of Kentucky. It's across the river to Missouri. And uh, there, there's no there's no way into the Kentucky Bend other than from Tennessee unless you bring from, your own boat from the south, yeah. But. So that's that. Now we reach Memphis, and we have a couple of well, we have this bridge, and then we have a cluster of bridges to talk about in Memphis. Mm-hmm. Um, let's deal with I forty first. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of people would agree that this is Memphis's signature bridge. Um, it's certainly the more artsy of the Mississippi River crossings. A lot of locals like to call it the M Bridge um, because, as you might be able to see from the the superstructure design, it's shaped like the letter M. Um, there are conflicting reports as to whether this is an intentional nod to the city of Memphis or this just happened to be the the best design that they came up with, but. Um, nevertheless, it has caught on as the M Bridge and is one of the symbols of the city of Memphis, which is one of its nicknames is the home of the blues. Uh, there's a great blues music scene in Memphis and really in the Mississippi Delta in general. But it, the, the capital, one of the unofficial capitals of the Mississippi Delta is Memphis. Um, it just mirrors Memphis slightly flooded at the moment. Uh, well, in which picture? No, right now. 
I can't tell. But... Well, well, there, no, I don't know about right now, but okay. Um, I'm also loving the Bass Pro Shops pyramid in the background of these pictures. One of the world's largest pyramids. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the way. Yeah, real quick. The pyramid was built, I think, around the year 2000. It was intended to be a sports arena. It was originally going to be the home of the Memphis Grizzlies basketball team. And then, for whatever reason, the pyramid just didn't work as a sports venue. And it actually sat unused for several years. Uh, before Bass Pro Shops came in and took over the the interior space and turned it into, I guess it's the world's largest Bass Pro Shops now. <laughs> and so, but f- further improvements have happened since then. Um, the um, the up the the top of the pyramid now has a restaurant and bar, and there's an observation deck at the very top. I so need you to can go, go there. I no, really want to go I, there I, too. You can be the all-seeing eye on the top of the pyramid. I, I've been. Um, <laughs> I've been, what do you call it? I've been meaning to go to the Pyramid for quite a while. I've been to Memphis. I've been through there a few times now, but I've never actually gone in there. I did not All right, road trip. So, so <laughs> it's also worth noting here that, therefore, it's about 200 river miles to the Pyramid from Cairo. Yeah, roughly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, like God. <laughs> they pronounce it differently in Egypt, yes. but... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the one thing you didn't mention about this bridge is that it's the traffic capital of Memphis also. Well, so I wanted to get into a couple of other things here. So, this bridge was built in the late 1960s and early 70s. It was completed in 1973. Um, part of the Interstate 40 corridor from conception to construction. Um, it connects the states of Tennessee and Arkansas. Now, this becomes important because as an interstate bridge, different states are responsible for different things as far as funding and as far as inspection is concerned. The two states, Tennessee and Arkansas, really were not in agreement on who was going to pay for the bridge initially. Um, Tennessee was looking for a 50-50 split, whereas Arkansas felt that Tennessee should fit more of the bill because the Tennessee side of the river is far more populated than the Arkansas side, and the bridge would be arguably benefiting Tennessee more than Arkansas. Eventually, what they agreed on was that Tennessee would agree to a 60-40 split, of the funding of the initial construction. In exchange for that, Arkansas DOT would assume most of the responsibility for the bridge inspection duties. Now this becomes important in a little bit if we fast forward almost 50 years um, to the year 2021. A routine inspection in May of 2021 discovered a complete fracture of a steel support edge girder on one of the main spans of the bridge. The inspector from Arkansas DOT immediately phoned 911 and the bridge was closed immediately afterwards. Uh, The bridge remained closed until August of that year uh, when at least some sort of a temporary repair was made so that the bridge could reopen. This slide that you're looking at now shows photos of the complete break in the edge girder. When they say complete break, they ain't kidding. No, and you can yeah. see these are obviously not my pictures, but you can see the uh, the gap in the in between the two in in between the the break and the beam and all that. Pennsylvania so, Turnpike extension. Well, I know what I know the bridge you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very similar story. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of things that we could get into here. Um, this fracture was c- clearly not discovered until it had completely broken there are pictures as far back as 2017 that showed this same girder with it some in sort progress of... i mean you can yeah. see yeah, it yeah you can see it in left. 2019 yeah. in 2019 it had not cracked all the way through quite yet but it had cracked most of the way through and that is clearly something that should have been picked up yeah on. an inspector should have called that out and it should have become a category yeah. eight effects i mean it's fine and yeah the well, other, right, and the bridge didn't fall extension. down; it's still there. But. Yeah, it's important to note that this the the fractured beam is not part of the primary support structure of this bridge. The primary support comes from the arch above. What is it? And it's like a stiffening cables. truss. It's more of a yeah. It's a stiffening truss, and it adds more redundancy at deck level. And it adds more redundancy. Um, more redundancy. Yes. Redundancy. Yes. Yes. Um, so. The, the fracturing of this beam was not going to cause the bridge to collapse anytime soon. Um, but obviously, nevertheless, it's not going to do to have a bridge of this magnitude with this amount of traffic on it mm-hmm. with this kind of a break 
and one of its main support members. Right. Well, I um, think what, 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 one of the problems here was that when they were doing the inspections, they, they weren't actually looking at the bottom of the beam. They were only looking at the top. And so when they looked at it from above, they didn't see the crack on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> until it so they were just through. yeah. I mean, so they were just looking. They were like walking the beam or something. There was some I think, sort they, I think of they were they were using one of those uh, uh, fall protection. One, one of those bucket trucks. Snooper. That, yeah, that goes underneath. Uh, they, 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 the way they would park it and swing it, it was just like basically this was not a spot where they were seeing mm-hmm. the underside. So, so it, it, it's, it's interesting if you care to read up on it that the, the that it, there was a flaw in the inspection procedure that. That the, it's not that the inspectors were ignoring this. I mean, how could you not notice it? it it's that it literally was basically in one of their blind spots. They weren't seeing it because they weren't looking. They at weren't that. checking. They the were walking the top yeah. of it. Right. I wonder if that's changed any inspection procedures for any. I'm, I, I, I think, any it, well, I think I, it has to. We yeah. have many yeah. clients around here who will do under deck and have crews hanging down below it, or for that matter, on a river like this, on boats below it, looking up. Yeah, so the, the, clearly this is a state agency issue of not having that in place. Right. No, the clearance... and what also makes this fascinating, too, is that, yeah, people have photos from 2019, from 2017, that they took from, like, boats while they were on the river or whatever, and they're like, hey, look, there's a crack. And, you know, either they weren't looking closely enough and they didn't notice because they were just ordinary people and they weren't looking for a crack in the bed. Yeah. Or they, you know, figured, well, I mean, someone who knows what they're talking about is probably aware of it, so it's not a big deal. And, you know, they, they weren't qualified to say otherwise. Um, yeah. so, you know, and, all right. And, and, and that's, that's also a, right, a key thing here is that for someone who has an engineering background, you would have the ability to look at something like this and make a judgment as to how much of a problem it is. Uh, but, but the majority of the population wouldn't be able to determine that. Yeah. So you can't fault the lay people for not doing anything about it. Mm-hmm. But you can fault the Arkansas DOT inspection staff for it, and that's exactly yes. what happened. The Arkansas DOT inspector in charge of this biennial inspection program was relieved of his duties, mm-hmm. and it resulted in significant overhauls of inspection protocol, not just here, but also in other states as well. Um, to have something like this go undetected for years is obviously a huge issue. Um, and hopefully it doesn't happen again. We're thankful that um, this kind of thing didn't lead to a catastrophic failure of the bridge. Um, they did a full inspection of the bridge while it was closed, and they discovered that this was the only instance of a fractured beam. Um, so otherwise, the rest, the rest of the bridge was safe. It was reopened. Uh, as I said, in August of 2021. Now, I just happened to be in Memphis in May of 2021, around Memorial Day weekend, and I got to witness the traffic Armageddon around (laughs) Memphis around that time. Because at that point, with I-40 taken out, there was only one bridge for automobile traffic open across the river at Memphis, which nice. we'll talk about in a, yeah. in the, a few The other thing you'll, you'll also notice you're looking at this photo is you don't see any traffic getting off that last day before the bridge either, and that's because the Tennessee DOT uh, closed it westbound at I-240. They did not let anyone uh, go up to those last exits. That's right. Yeah. And just, just because they didn't want... Uh, you know, in theory, it would have still been totally usable for local traffic, but they didn't want people going there, uh, you know, and, and getting confused and getting lost. Mm-hmm. Especially since, uh, you know, normally you would have been able to get off that exit and go down that road along the riverfront to get to the I-55 bridge, and that would have actually been a pretty logical detour, except, uh, unfortunate timing, that road was closed for construction at the time, yeah. <laughs> so right. you couldn't go that way, yeah. even if... Even if I forty had been left open to that exit, I think Riverside Drive has been perpetually under construction yeah. in the last ten years. Yeah, when I said it's <laughs> closed down there, that's because it's closed right now. So I think it is closed right now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, in, okay. I I drove it in April of twenty nineteen. It wasn't closed then. <laughs> but, I think there was only one time when it was actually open when I was in. I've been in Memphis, I think, three times, and there was. <laughs> that was the. There was one time when it was actually open that I was able to drive it. Did you make sure to clinch the whole thing that day? Hey, you, you bet, yo. You know what? Absolutely. <laughs> we don't know what. Um, Use your imagination. So, yeah. So the bridge reopened, and it's been. There have been no significant issues with it 
since then. Um, I think they had to do an emergency repair to a, an expansion joint somewhere along the way in the that's, last few months. That's common, though. Joints fail, fail really yeah. quick. Yeah. Um, but um, being designed to move and all. Yeah. And just with how, because a joint is where all the water goes to, yeah. and so they tend to have issues and they tend to fail, like, when they fail, they often go very quick. Yeah. I actually have video on my channel, too. I know 504 Road Trip said this in the chat, but I did film the drive on I-55 while the uh, the I-40 bridge was closed, and that was interesting. <laughs> That's an interesting trip. Oh, God. Look, more ridges. Nothing down there is interesting while while a bridge like that is closed. Yeah, well, so you just got to be over the bridge before yeah. eleven o'clock. That that's the yeah. thing. You do Otherwise, you, you get stuck. You, you gotta know? do what you did and just take pictures without driving. <laughs> Much better that way. Oh yeah. So just uh, a couple of miles downstream from the I forty bridge, we have a cluster of bridges. Um, and this was the original site where bridges were constructed across the Mississippi River at Memphis. Um, let's deal with all three of them separately, and then we'll kind of bring it all together at the end here. So, first up on the list is the Frisco Bridge, which was the first bridge built over the Lower Mississippi River. And so naturally it is the oldest, and it's the oldest surviving bridge, and the oldest still active bridge, even. Um, opened in 1892. It was the crowning achievement of its chief engineer, a gentleman named George Morrison, um, who is, who up until that point was more famous for his contributions, um, further north. He has a lot of railroad bridges that were built on the Missouri River, especially, um, and also a couple up on the upper Mississippi River, the, um, the Kate Shelley High Rise was one of his projects as well. Um, he also, after this project, and after all the fanfare that he got for the delivery of this project, he went on to be on the Canal Commission in 1899 that eventually selected the alignment for the Panama Canal. Uh, he did not live to see the canal's completion, but he was a part of selecting the alignment for it. Um, the, most of this bridge, well, a lot of it is still original. The part of it that is not is the Arkansas Approach, which you can see on the right. That was replaced in a project that was completed in 2017. Um, otherwise, the Tennessee Approach and the superstructure itself is more or less original. Um, so the Frisco Bridge was a huge hit. Um, as I said, it was the first railroad bridge a bridge of any kind on the lower Mississippi. So it attracted a lot of traffic. It opened up a lot of new opportunities as far as, you know, new travel corridors, new expansion of railroad systems in the Deep South. And as you might imagine, this quickly became a problem. Uh, the Frisco Bridge was built as a single track bridge, and with all the new trains wanting to cross the Mississippi at Memphis, um, the Frisco quickly became overrun with train traffic. So it wasn't too long before Memphis officials began to plan a supplemental bridge at the same site. And this bridge was constructed from 1912 to 1916 and opened in that year as the Harahan Bridge. Um, this is an interesting structure. I'll mention, I'll get into the engineering of it in a second, but I want to mention that the name of it honors a gentleman named James Theodore Harahan who was a prominent railroad executive of the time, and he was involved in the planning of this new bridge. And ironically, he was killed in a train derailment while <laughs> on the way to Memphis to finalize the plans for the construction of this bridge. He was killed in a train derailment in 1912. <laughs> um, so he never got to see this project see the light of day, but the bridge was completed in 1916 and named in his honor. One of the interesting parts of the Harahan Bridge is that it came about roughly 20 years after the Frisco Bridge, which means that by the time of the early 1900s, transportation habits were starting to shift slightly. Um, the railroads were still king in the Deep South, but there was also this new technology coming about called the automobile. And it was decided to incorporate lanes on this bridge for automobile traffic. They were known originally in, on the on the go the original plans as wagonways, uh, and it was a single lane in each direction that was cantilevered outside the steel yep. superstructure. Um, 
so this so that bridge was so the Harahan bridge was the first bridge in Memphis to actually carry automobile traffic. Um, this worked up to a point. Um, specifically, it worked up until say the day after it opened, <laughs> and people realized that there was a lot more demand for automobile traffic between Memphis and Arkansas than they ever would have imagined. Um, so we'll revisit that in just a second. But when the the pedest when the original wagon way was closed uh, in 1949. It sat unused for a number of years, and it was finally brought back in more recent years as a pedestrian walkway. One you of can, them, anyway. One of them, yes. The, See, on the far side in the photo. The, yeah, the, the uh, one in the near side definitely is not. Yeah, the, uh, the northern wagonway was converted to a pedestrian facility known as the Big River Crossing. And you can visit this today, and you can clinch the bridge on foot if you want. And it's interesting when you're crossing the bridge on foot and there's a train going by. I'll just say that. Did you you did walk it? I did do that. Nice. Yeah. Memphis me. When did that walkway open? Uh, within the last ten years. Yeah. It's I think twenty. I want to say twenty sixteen. Okay. Yeah. Um. I actually have info on this. Do you now? I do. I just gotta pull it up. Oh okay. Yeah. Um, oh, where is it? I do have to say the Harahan getting killed by a train is almost as ironic as Roblin getting killed by a ferry. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that's, that's, here, yeah. That's how famous engineers bit the dust back in the day, yeah. Yeah, it was by essentially their own creation. Yeah. Well, at least Roblin was trying to replace ferries. Oh, God, and if you read anything about him, he despised ferries with a passion, too. Yeah, that's oh, what gee, I, I, I can see I love that. fairies. Yeah. Stocking. <laughs> But anyway, so regarding the the p bicycle pedestrian walkway, in February 2011, Union Pacific Railroad officials agreed to the idea of converting the 1917 roadways um, into the walkway. In June 2012, Memphis was awarded a $14.9 million federal grant to build the walkway. Um, the overall project was expected to cost $30 million, of which about $11 million was used for the Harahan Bridge portion, and construction was completed in 2016. Okay. There you go. 2016. Yeah, and there's a nice view of downtown Memphis to the north when you're on this side, which I'm assuming is the reason why they refurbished this side of the bridge. Well, most um, people don't want to walk between two bridges where you can't see anything. That's only us but, weirdos. But I do. I was going to yeah. say, but us weirdos do. <laughs> no, us normies and weirdos. But, uh, yeah, so some of the builder's plaques are still uh, in place here. I think a couple of them have been restored. These are these are a couple on the Harahan Bridge. This picture on the left is a drone picture of the still abandoned walkway on the south side of the bridge. Was there a deck on that originally? Do you yes. Know? Absolutely. Well, yes. What? No, those are on the wheel paths. The, 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 deck, the deck was removed uh, in order to uh, relieve the structure of the weight. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, so that's the Harahan Bridge. Now, I said that automobile traffic was... You know, the capacity on the Harahan Bridge for automobile traffic was adequate for about a day. Um, and so Memphis officials realized as time went on in the years, you know, in the Roaring Twenties and in the 1930s, as automobile traffic really started to become the dominant feature of Cross River traffic, officials decided, well, we need a, let's just build a third bridge. We've already built two. Let's just add another one. Because they're good at it by now. Yeah, so at the same site, they constructed a third bridge. This one is the southernmost of the three. Uh, it is officially named the Memphis and Arkansas Bridge. And notice the ampersand, because there is some debate as to what the actual official name of the bridge is, and you need only look at the these plaques that are on the uh, Tennessee approach to the bridge. Also, dead face. Yeah, well, <laughs> maybe. Uh, maybe well, it's a Schrodinger face. Me Memphis gonna Memphis. What can I say? It's nice when I forty is closed and everyone can pile into a four lane trust. Yeah, a four lane trust that is an interstate and name only, right? Uh, it does carry Interstate 55, but it was designed and built before the interstate highway system was a thing. Oh, yeah. Not have shoulders. <laughs> no oh, yeah. shoulders, uh, no median of any sort. There's yeah, just well, a concrete a barrier. barrier. Well, it's got the Jersey barrier. Now but there's it's, no, yeah. it's a very Pennsylvania turnpike-y experience to drive across it if you're in the left lane. Um, 
So this is this up until 1973 was the only real highway bridge on the oh. Mississippi uh, at Memphis. Um, and so those of you who are road enthusiasts will know that on the Tennessee end of this bridge, the bridge dumps you into mm-hmm. Crump Boulevard and there's a cloverleaf interchange and you got to navigate a ramp to continue on I-55. It's well, especially fun in the northbound direction. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Especially when the I-40 bridge is closed. Oh! <laughs> I did not experience it while the I-40 bridge was closed. Yeah. Uh. So, so the... Um, Tennessee DOT is actually finally doing something about this in a project that is building flyovers to carry the main line of I-55 yeah. around the Crump Boulevard interchange, which I believe that project is scheduled to be completed in around the year 2025. Road trip? I'm, I'm cool with a Memphis meet in 2025. That's cool. Yeah. Um, they should rename it to Copama. Hot take. Yeah, what he said. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how to get a n- bridge named after me, so we need to work on that. You have to be killed by something associated with the bridge. I can work with that. You have to work, <laughs> you have to work your way up to being chief engineer for one, baby. Although they don't seem to name bridges after engineers anymore. That's They're just named no. for politicians yeah. nowadays. They're usually yeah. for like famous so people. So you, you have to run for Congress. That's what you got to do. Sometimes they name them for a famous sports player, like a Pat Tillman Bridge and... Well, uh, it's not the, Ho- the Hoover Dam. Stan, Stan, bridge, well, right? oh, yeah. over the Mississippi River, Stan Usual has a bridge. Okay, we're gonna yeah. work on this. This is a this is our project. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So anyway, Tennessee DOT, and I didn't include a picture of this in the uh, the slideshow, but that cloverleaf interchange is being replaced with a basically flyovers for I-55, and then the existing footprint of that cloverleaf is going to be converted into a roundabout where all those ramps are going to come in. Uh, where Riverside Drive goes off to the north and where Crump Boulevard goes off to the east, those are all going to be fed into this giant it, roundabout. It is also worth noting. that's going to work. Well, it is, it is, it is well, also worth noting. Because most of, most of the traffic that goes through there is I-55 traffic. So I, if I, you are building the flyovers to bypass okay. the circle, then it should work. It is also worth um, noting. It is built the way it was because uh, Riverside Drive was originally supposed to be a freeway and the, 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 the high-speed ramps from I-40 were built to accommodate this. So if that were a freeway, you would have a lot more traffic continuing straight through to I-40 rather than getting off to go over the bridge right there. Yeah. But I-40 is on the other bridge. Yes, it is. Okay. Well, back, back in the <laughs> early, early iterations of the Memphis freeway plan, yeah, there was a plan to put a freeway along what Riverside Drive is now. And so that, that's why I-55 takes that jog to the west. It, it has to use Before. what was actually built, yeah. basically. Yeah. Well, so they basically they, the original plan. Yeah, they kind of had to piece it together from what was already there. Yeah, um, but yeah, if you ever are in Memphis and you like bridges, this is an area to check out. The cluster of the three of them together is quite an interesting and photogenic spot, especially if you have a drone like I do. I you know, might be just talking. saying, just throwing that out. You do there. seem to be droning on and on about this. Yeah, well, what can Sounds I say? Like it's time for the rest of us to buy a drone. I, you know, I've been arguing for you to get into this drone <laughs> stuff for quite some time. I now. would one hundred percent crash into the river. <laughs> <laughs> the MD Roads crew actually has a small drone. Is it one of those like toy RC drone thingies? Kind of, but it's not like. I mean, yeah, you can't. You're not going to be able to like, you know, send it to the middle of the Mississippi River. But it's still useful for you know doing some road photos and. You know, it goes up pretty high. Yeah, so that, that that's actually a good way to learn. Yeah. You know, just to start off on something simple. And then, you know, when, once you get comfortable with that, then you can graduate to the big leagues. That's right. Can I, I mention my, favorite, my actual favorite picture of these three bridges together is not a drone picture. It's the picture we're looking at right now, oh. um, which was taken at literally river level on the arkansas side of the river were you swimming so the river i couldn't i I, the the, river comes up by five the river came up to my feet where i took this picture Mm -hmm. yeah so i could have jumped in if i wanted to Um, i think the lens should have been at river level (laughs) thank you for saying at river level next time steve memphis meet in 2025 i'll do that Woo! (laughs) Woo! oh no it's it's happening now I and guess so, right? Hey, middle. people are posting meets for two years from now anyway. Yeah. So or even below river level, they do make waterproof cameras. I have one. I'm going to swim to the middle of the river. <laughs> <laughs> I like this. The river looks Goodness like gracious, great balls of fire. <laughs> you don't have to breathe. You just have to take the 
And yeah, hey, Laura, you actually, wanted to you wanted to add something else to the Memphis talk, right? I, I did. So why I, you know, just casually threw that in there is because the Memphis and Arkansas Bridge can be seen in scenes of the 1989 film Great Balls of Fire, starring Dennis Quaid as Jerry Lee Lewis. And it's also referenced in the Chuck Berry song Mississippi, uh, Memphis, Tem- Tennessee, where it is simply called the Mississippi Bridge. I'm not in tune, so I'm not going to sing it for you, but at least I'll read to you verse two. <laughs> Uh, help me information get me get in touch with my marie she's the only one who'd phone me here from memphis tennessee her home is on the south side high up on a ridge just a half mile from the mississippi bridge i'm glad you actually know the words i would have been able to i would have been able to sing memphis tennessee and (laughs) had to mutter the rest (laughs) (laughs) it's almost like she planned to get me memphis tennessee Yes, imagine that. I have notes and I plan ahead. Thank you, Erica, for acknowledging that. <laughs> Anything for you, Laura. Aww. Aww. So that's the Memphis story. Moment of silence for all. I'm jealous. Yeah. Moving on, because we have a lot more bridges to get to. Yeah. I feel like we could have just ended the show there, but Yay. we do have more to get to tonight. Um, oh, wait, there's more. <laughs> Now, in firmly in the Mississippi Delta region of western Mississippi, which is on the Mississippi River, I hope that's not too confusing for you, uh, we have the Helena Bridge, which was built in 1961. Um, this is, there's not a whole lot in this general area of western Mississippi or north or eastern arkansas it's sometimes people describe it as a bridge to nowhere it is part of the u.s 49 corridor which in the deep south is a pretty substantial corridor in its own right um it does connect with the village of helena west helena arkansas (laughs) which yes if you're wondering there were two separate villages that they uh consolidated in the year 2006 they couldn't decide on a common name, so they were like, screw it. We'll just hyphenate and <laughs> use both of our names. I mean, I note, so. at, I note at this point it would serve the Tunica uh, casinos pretty well, so years after it was built, it actually became a bridge to somewhere. Yeah, and there is a casino right on the Mississippi side of the bridge. I forget the name yeah. of it, but um, casinos that have been built Isle since... Isle of Casino Hotel Lula. That's it, yeah. Uh, So that one, and then also the more famous Tunica resorts, which are closer to Memphis. Um, Those those can be reached by crossing this bridge. Um, When I was in this area in February of 2023, I had originally planned to clinch, you know, US 61 all the way up from Baton Rouge to Memphis. But I instead took a little bit of a diversion and instead clinched Mississippi State Highway 1. So which, you'll have to revisit it. Well, Ooh, I guess you, so, Did right? you visit a, uh, a particular homestead while you were on Route 1? Uh, Jim Henson? Well, see, I found out about that after the fact. Oh, I did not I did not know that he was from Greenville. Yeah. There's yeah. nothing else there but that. So. <laughs> yeah, well. It is the only Not reason, anymore. In it, the least, only reason I know. could think of to visit down there. Yeah. But um, this is still this is still an interesting bridge to check out. If you like these long steel cantilevers, some people in our community refer to them as metal monsters, which might be a little too ominous for speaking, my liking. Of Jim Henson. But yeah, <laughs> but but if if you're into that kind of engineering and and bridge design, there there are a lot of bridges on the Lower Mississippi that look very similar to this one, and this will not be the last one that we see that looks like this. Um. So it's definitely it's definitely worth a side trip if you're in the area. Also, none of them are told. Well, I know that's what makes you happy. <laughs> well, it's surprising for a river of that width that they don't try to toll any of them. I think that some of the bridges on the Lower Mississippi were told when they were built, but tolls were at eliminated. At least one of them was told into the 21st century, even. Uh, into the 21st century. Is this in Louisiana? Well, I know. Oh. You're talking about the one in New Orleans. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we'll get to that one at some point right. tonight. It might take until midnight, but we'll get there. Um, I want to bring up this bridge really quick. Um, it's not a bridge that exists currently, but it is one that has been talked about for many years. It has been on the planning maps for a lot of years. 
and has apparently been approved for construction. It is shovel ready, as they say. Uh, it's just that funding has not been allocated to the states of Mississippi and Arkansas to ensure its construction. The I-69 corridor south of Mississippi is planned to cross the Mississippi River um, on this proposed bridge, named for Charles Dean, who was a civil engineer who lived in northwestern Mississippi, uh, who first actually had the idea for the bridge in the 1980s. There you go. Maybe we do still name bridges after engineers. Well, at least until they rename it for, I don't know, Haley Barber or something. They're going to find some governor of Arkansas's name. Yeah. Uh, So anyway, the working title of this bridge was, I believe, before it was named for Dean, it was the Great River Bridge. That was the working title of it. Um, this bridge would be a large cable stay suspension boo. bridge. Yeah, I know you like to boo, but I'm going to cheer because well, I can. <laughs> you right. know. Um, um, I'll, I'll go with cheering. It's pretty. If you are familiar with the Stan Musial Bridge in St. Louis. Uh, Yay! That... <laughs> I go with the crowd. Yay! Um, if you are familiar with the Stan Musial Bridge in St. Louis, that would be a good model for what this bridge would be, except it would be a bigger version of that. Um, the pylon and superstructure design would be very similar. The only diff- one of the differences is, is that the main span will be significantly longer. Uh, it would, it was originally when they proposed this bridge, it was going to be the longest cable stay bridge in North America. I don't know that that's going to be the case anymore because there have been longer bridges built since then. Right. Well, there's, there's, there's also it. another way this rendering is inaccurate and in that if built, it will never have that many vehicles on it at once. Yeah. So that's, that's, <laughs> so that is. No, once they complete I-69, it's going to carry everyone from Mexico to Canada. <laughs> Yeah, so that's one of the reasons why Arkansas DOT has designated this project as a quote-unquote low-priority project. Right. Um, well, right-of-way acquisition has begun on the Arkansas side of the river. However, it is not even on Arkansas's long-term construction to-do list at this point. Right. And, and, well, this is the thing with, with the I-69 corridor, right, is that the, the original highway uh, north of Indianapolis... From Indianapolis to, it, to, to Memphis, it makes sense as a highway. And is being built. And Right, and is being built. Uh, you know, from the Mexican border, basically up to I-20, it still makes sense as a highway and is being built. But the part between I-20 and Memphis is kind of... It, 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 existing <clears throat> interstates are shorter than it, and it doesn't really hit anything of significance along the way that nothing, something else doesn't. Yeah, so it's so, it's, uh, it, it's kind it's kind of you know a line on the map in order to connect the two I sixty nines without long concurrencies, but it yeah this is the, the, don't 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 uh, don't uh, hold your breath for this bridge anytime soon. Yeah, so <gasps> so the states of like Mississippi built a piece of it, but that was more to connect Memphis with Tunica with the casinos. Yeah, that, that was the mo- things. that was the motivation there, and otherwise Mississippi. Arkansas, even Louisiana, they don't have any interest in building it at this point. So without those three states in harmony and actively constructing anything, um, it's very unlikely that we'll see construction on this particular bridge um, anytime soon. There is a bit of a bypass, a US-278 bypass around Monticello, Arkansas, that is built on the right-of-way for the I-69 corridor. In fact, there is a sign that says future I-69 corridor at where the bypass comes into whatever that is. Yeah, but again, I'm not, you know, don't hold your breath for construction of any of that. Oh, jeez. All right. Speaking of cable stay bridges. Just going to say, I do prefer the cable stays that don't connect at the very top. I do think this, I do like this look better than the other I do prefer the suspension bridges. Well, nobody's going to argue with a classic suspension bridge, right? They're better. They don't Everywhere. build. They don't build them like they used to. They in don't America. build them anymore because they're more expensive. But they're and better. these are a lot more redundant and easier to maintain. That too. So I would like to address that for a second. Why are there no traditional suspension bridges over the Mississippi River, especially the lower river? Um, a lot of it has to do with subsurface soil conditions. Um, a lot of the Mississippi, the Mississippi Delta region, and especially as you get down to Louisiana. The soil is very soft. It's silty clays with, you know, a lot of organic material in it. Very bad quality soil if you're going to try to anchor suspension bridge cables into concrete anchor blocks in the ground. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so that is why cantilever truss bridges became very popular here. Mm-hmm. And in more recent years, cable stay bridges have taken the place of cantilever bridges. Because you only really, I mean, the Mississippi River, for as much traffic as it handles, river traffic that is, you only really need intermediate length spans uh, at the main span. So that is well within the reach of cable stay bridge technology. And that's why you have a lot of these intermediate span bridges, whether they're cantilever bridges that are older. Some of them are more recent, as we'll talk about later. But the the newer bridges, by and large, are cable state bridges that can span comparable lengths to the steel cantilever trusses. Right, and the, the soil conditions go back to that Mississippi embayment thing I mentioned earlier, that basically uh, the lower Mississippi River is a river now, but if you go back... Uh, you know, a few ice ages in in the past, uh, it was actually a uh, a large a large inland sea. You know, the, the, it basically the river ended where Cairo now is, and everything south of there was a was a very wide, uh, you know, open, you know, extension of the Gulf of Mexico. Basically, it still is every April and May. And <laughs> right, well, and so and so it, over over time, it uh, that that uh, that bay filled in with silt. Uh, but that's also why all the soil is, is, you know, clay and muck is because all of all all of the soil anywhere near the river at this point is all just sediment that the river dumps there at some point. Hmm. So that, follow yeah. up to something you said earlier. Can true suspension bridges span more than cable stays? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so for instance, the world's longest suspension bridge is now in Turkey across the mm-hmm. Dardanelle Strait. That bridge spans close to a mile and a half is per, this is per span for this for the main span yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. like Arizona is well over a mile for yeah but when we, when we talk about span length we're talking about between the towers we're talking about main yeah. span right. yeah right. I don't so, care about total bridge length yeah the suspension yeah. bridge technology has evolved to the point where we can build spans between the towers of over a mile the wow. thing is just that um, in, in most cases there's no reason to well yeah yeah, yeah there's like in the Dardanelles case there's a good reason to but yeah, you know, well, like you mentioned, on these bridges, there's no reason to span any more than they have. Right. Yeah. Because the, the shipping channel is, even though the bri- even though the river is as prominent as it is, and is as prominent as the river traffic is, the channel is well defined. Yeah. You know, within these bounds, and you, you're like, okay, well, how can we build a bridge as cheap as possible? I mean, well, yeah. not building as Louisiana. short a main span as possible. I mean, clearance is so. probably the bigger issue for these ones. In in Louisiana, Louisiana, but even but even with that, most of the river traffic on the Lower Mississippi is barge traffic. So you okay. don't need to build tall bridges. So I was going to say, the clearance bridges. doesn't look that high on these, the but that thing, makes sense. The thing that burns you cost-wise is the length of the bridge from abutment to abutment, because you're not just spanning the river, you're spanning from levee to levee. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the levees are much further back from the river. So take, for example, the Greenville, Greenville Bridge, which, mm-hmm. when you look at it, it's, it's a very modest bridge. There's nothing all that remarkable about it. The Greenville Bridge is about two and a half miles long from abutment to abutment. Why is that? Because it's crossing the floodplain between the levees. Right, and they need to leave enough room for the river to still flow under it when the river is at its maximum flow rate. And if the levee breaks, you'll have no place to drive. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, I see what Steve did there. Um, The Greenville Bridge is actually, it was when it was completed in 2010, the longest cable state bridge in North America, or sorry, in the United States, not North America. Main span length. Main span length. Okay. Which one passed it? Uh, that's a question that I don't have right in front of me at the moment. I, there is another cable state bridge on the lower Mississippi that's longer than it. I think okay. it might have actually been that bridge that broke the record. Um, the uh, the Fraser Bridge in Vancouver was longer. Vancouver is not in America. Yeah. That's why I said United States, not North yes. America. Yes. Yeah, see? Okay. See, you, you're thinking ahead. Yeah, that. that's right. So, <laughs> All right. this bridge replaced an old cantilever truss bridge known as the Benjamin Humphreys this Bridge that was built in 1940. That bridge was built on a dangerous curve in the Mississippi River. And there were a number of barge strikes over the years, and they said, "Well, the best thing to do at this point is to just yeah. build a new bridge and you know replace it." I think at least no oh. barge ever hit it hard enough to knock it down. Well, that's true. I want to note the longest cable stayed span in the world, which is in Vladivostok, is thirty six twenty two feet. So the practical maximum 
is half of what it is for a suspension bridge. Right. I am now scrolling well down so. to find anything. <laughs> everything oh, else is I China wanna, now. I want to point out something, too. Yes. That, that the uh, the um, Benjamin G. Humphreys Bridge, the first Greenbelt Bridge, was built by the company now known as HNTB. Woo! That'll make somebody in this room happy. And someone angry. <laughs> <laughs> We don't do wow. cable stay. I'm not too concerned about somebody just, else doing cable anybody stay. Anybody else who works for one of your competitors. We uh, don't do yeah. cable stay. This was never a concern. Oh, <laughs> this boy. is good. There, 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 there's four engineers that work for four different engineering firms in this room. <laughs> just FYI to everyone listening. Yes, <laughs> and, and, a planner, and a planner on Skype. We make a, we make a very interesting uh, uh, roundtable of hosts tonight. You know, when we're not live and we're just talking, you should really hear the discussion. It's really interesting. Well, I think it's, it's nerdy. It's, what, I, <laughs> what I thought was interesting was I crossed this old bridge in Auto Route 19, and it turns out that that was cable stayed. And it was from the 60s or 70s, and it was rusty and whatever. I'm just like, I was so shocked that that something like that existed that long ago. Because all these long ones are recent, but apparently these go back yeah. to the 60s. I mean, we can Well, argue... cable state technology really was invented in the 50s in Europe. Well, yeah. we can um, argue that the Brooklyn Bridge is partly cable state, and that's from the 1860s. Right. I mean, they didn't. They didn't. They not didn't. primarily. Not it does, it does have the diagonal supplemental but it cables. It does have cable stay type yeah. cables built in. They didn't know that that's what it was. Timeline of bridges. <laughs> yeah. the, the first bridge with some form of cable state construction that won was the old Red Hue Bridge in England in 1871. I was going to say, something like this has to have because, I mean, because. The idea of a suspension bridge on a small scale is not that complicated. I mean, you know, there have been yeah. suspension bridges going back to even before the Industrial Revolution, if you build it out of road. The first but... cable state bridge to go over a 500-foot span is the Stromsen Bridge in Sweden, Excuse which you? was constructed in <laughs> 1956 and still stands as one of those, yeah. has like two cables to the whole thing. Right. Well, I think that, I think a lot of people, yeah. a lot of people cite that as the first modern cable state bridge. Yeah. I yeah. like that picture. Which was 1956, yeah. yeah. Right, well, another thing worth noting here is that another reason that cable stay bridges have overtaken suspension bridges in a lot of cases, besides them being cheaper to build, uh, it, it is that we figured out actually how to build them. Um, you know, to, mm -hmm. to, to build a suspension bridge, you know, you, they, well, they start the same way. You put up two towers. But to build a suspension bridge, you then have to have to string the main cables and then, and then, and then, ha and then hang all your suspender ropes and then start hanging the deck from them. To build a cable stay bridge, it's not quite as cleanly sequential. You have to start with the bottom cables and put sections of deck in, and do that. And you got to try and yeah, keep it balanced. One cable at a time, that. yeah. Right. So, so uh, uh, that became a lot more practical to do once we figured out how to how to do prefabricated sections of bridge deck. That was a big break. For right. Yeah. Well, before you had prefabricated bridge deck, building mm -hmm. a cable stay bridge was very tricky. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I took an entire course that did nothing but talk about cable stay, and after an entire course in that I was no closer to figuring out the math behind it than when it started. So <laughs> these are not simple, and I applaud every structural engineer who's able to design one of these. And we let you guys do this? <laughs> you just well, said your company does this. I said, well, somebody, I. Well, somebody. <laughs> I said, this, I. Also, this also leads to other fun things. Like at the, at the outer ends of the bridge, the, the net force on it is actually pulling upward. Those end piers are holding the bridge down. That's right. Which adds yeah. a lot of complications to yeah. designing the pier because, side note, concrete doesn't do tension. So trying to design a concrete pier in tension adds a lot of complications. When I told we you we had a room full of engineers. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean? Of when we, there's, there's tensile concrete out there. There was... A lot of microfibers. So some of the engineering and the anchor piers or those outside piers on the uh, the replacement for the bridge that was formerly known as the Tappan Zee Bridge, um, <laughs> yes, there were separate. I don't know how common this is in other. Um, and that's why we want this. No, are you guys good over there? Yes. Okay, good. Um, there were for that bridge. There were separate tie down anchors that were built into the anchor piers that were meant to take the tension away out of the concrete oh. for that. It is a very interesting engineering that went into that, yeah. And I, I don't know how common it is, but I would imagine that, you know, you got to account for those forces somehow in the structure, so. Yeah. Um, oh, forces. I heard horses. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> 
There's someone in this room who will talk to, to you about horses all and horses. Oh. horses. And horses. Horses can be a live load across a bridge. Sure. Well, the Brooklyn Bridge had elephants at one point. There you go. Yeah, but they're they're not a live load when they get to the other end. Yeah, they're These dead. ones were. <laughs> <laughs> at some point, they end up a dead load. That's... I don't think you understand what dead load and live load are. A dead animal is still a live load. No, not if you leave it there. Well, not necessarily. No, a dead animal on the bridge deck will always be a live load. Because it's not permanently affixed to the bridge. No, if it becomes, yeah. it becomes theory, mummified. theory, someone should come up there and move it at some if point. If it becomes <laughs> mummified and sticks to the bridge, it becomes a dead load. Read Ashto, it's still a live load. Uh, the, it's interesting, though, that this, that this is like different from buildings where like things like filing cabinets are actually considered dead loads. But anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we anyway, room full of engineers! <laughs> I do want to mention real quick, if you drive this bridge, especially in the eastbound direction into Mississippi, you might notice that the bridge suddenly takes a jog to the left and there's this graded right of way that continues straight and there's an, there's an overpass ahead and there's it looks like there should be a freeway continuing straight ahead. Well, you would be correct that there should be a freeway <laughs> continuing straight ahead. Uh, a bypass of Greenville has been in the works for many years and it was the, the arrangement of this bridge incorporated the potential future bypass around Greenville into it. Um, my understanding is that construction of the proper Greenville bypass finally got the green light within the last Ooh. few months. Ooh. Um, There's an interchange. And it will be signed as US 82 upon its completion <laughs> in the next that. several years, whenever yeah. that might yeah. be. I think I, we need to do this meet before then because I need to see the overpass in the middle of nowhere. Yep. Well, I mean, you entire could be, dirt graded interchange with a random concrete overpass. It's beautiful. Well, you could you could go there right now. No, actually, know, the entire road weekend. is drivable. Well, the overpass is drivable. Yeah. yeah no, they, the, they the whole thing. The, the whole thing is drivable all the way out. Well, yeah, if you're in a tractor. Maybe not this. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I'm doing it in my rental car. I don't care. Yeah. Okay. Oh, all right. Well, you have fun with that. All right. I'll I bring. Will. I'll get a mountain bike and do it with that. That sounds like more fun. All right. Well, fantastic. Well, it's, um, it's near Leland. I want to talk about Vicksburg, because that's the next community and the meat on our list. Uh, what? And the meat that was there. Well, I thought we were doing a meet in Memphis. No, the, the former... Oh, that was Natchez was the meet. I well, thought Vicksburg had a meet also. Well, you did a meet in Natchez, what, last year? Yeah, I thought Vicksburg had one a few years ago also. I don't know. I think so. If there was one, I didn't go to it, so I don't know. <laughs> so it doesn't count if you weren't there. <laughs> uh, we have another cluster of bridges in Vicksburg. Um, one of them is nowadays for railroad traffic. One of them is for highway traffic. Um, it wasn't always like that, though. One of the bridges used to carry both, particularly the old bridge, which was built in 1930. Um, one of the longest cantilever trusses in the world, actually, when it was completed. Oh, wow. Um, it carries the Kansas City Southern Railroad today, but it also carried the original alignment of U.S. Route 80, mm -hmm. uh, which back in those days was known as the Dixie Overland Highway. Uh, a major east-west thoroughfare for the Deep South, connecting um, central and southern Georgia with northern texas and like the dallas area like the basically the traditional bible belt that we think of today um us 80 was one of the main streets of that whole region at the time you might notice that there's an american flag at the top of this bridge and the story behind this is a little bit foggy it's not like actually the on the right yeah like the photo <laughs> on the right exactly um it's not actually clear when they put this flag up for the first time or who actually did it. It likely was done by the Kansas City Southern because they are responsible for the maintenance of this bridge today. Um, there is documentation of this flag going as far back as 1994. So it, it likely was early to mid-90s when it was put up. Um, but it is, a it is a unique site on a Mississippi River bridge to have this large American, free-flying free American flag. Say it's got quite a pull on it. Usually even if you see br uh, flags on top of bridges, they don't have that high of a pull before the bridge. Uh, it's already high up enough for that yeah. Flag. yeah. Yeah. Well, when I was there in February on a couple of occasions, um, the only day that I was able to fly it was when the flag was relatively slackened. Um, 
I checked the flag to see what the wind was doing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Useful for that purpose. There was there was there was one day when the flag was really whipping at the top of that bridge, and the mm. wind was really gusting that day. So it, it, you can if you're in if you're a drone pilot and you're wondering mm. like how strong the wind is, look for the nearest flag if there's one around you. That's a good indication. Oh, well, this is this is know? why wind socks at airports are things. That's um, that's true too. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing worth noting about the old bridge is that the roadway for former US-80 is still there. Uh, it is quite fenced off and close to the public. You cannot yeah. drive or even walk in. The other side, you could get some decent views of it, whereas this side, you're limited to exactly here. Yeah, well, from from the Louisiana side, you can, you know, the, the road leading up to the, the bridge is still actually part of the state highway system. You can drive it to so a you, degree. So you can drive it up to the, basically to the bridge abutment. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then climb some fences? No. <laughs> I, I have been to the western edge of it, and it, they've torn up quite a bit so that you can't get onto the bridge. They should make it a pedestrian path. You know, that wouldn't be a bad idea, actually. Clothing. But the Kansas City Southern maintains that roadway for their own maintenance purposes. So, good luck with that. Right. They, they're they, not. They, they're they, not going to give that up. They use it for their authorized personnel. It's now, on the Vicksburg side of the river, you can visit the Mississippi Welcome Center, and you can walk to where the original toll plaza for the bridge was. Yep. And that's where this picture in the, the upper left Ooh, and the lower that. right is from. That's cute with the little truss. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a replica. Yeah, it's a it's a to scale replica. Yeah. Um, so you can check that out, and there's bridge plaques there that tell you the history of the old US-80 at Vicksburg. Um, so that's, so that's, so that's worth a stop, I would say. Yep. The Mississippi Welcome and, Center, and, by the way, is where I got the picture here, um, And Vicksburg itself slide. is worth stopping. Yeah, so whether it's you really... like the bridges or whether you like American history, particularly Civil War history, there's a lot of stuff to dive into with in Vicksburg. Battle, Drop off your friends and Yeah, there's a minor and skirmish in Vicksburg, you know, at some point, yeah. <laughs> so, all kidding aside, Vicksburg was the last point in the Mississippi that the Union Navy seized it's, along the point of the sure Mississippi. That's pretty well. Um, yeah, yeah. Vicksburg actually surrendered to the yeah, Union yeah. on July 4th. 1863 and perhaps not coincidentally uh the city of vicksburg as a as an entity refused to celebrate the fourth of july until 1943 <laughs> i wonder why um, it's an american flag being hey gone. you know states states come first even even in more recent times down south um and other places so i mentioned that us 80 used to be on the old bridge and as you might imagine, a bridge that shares a superstructure with active railroad and a very narrow two-lane roadway would someday become inadequate. And that did happen before too long. So a second bridge at the same site was planned and constructed. Um, the second bridge was completed in 1973. Um, and this it, one actually sort of has a shoulder. Sort of. Yeah, <laughs> loose term it's, of shoulder. It's slightly wider than the one in Memphis. Pretty much until I became an engineer, it was acceptable to narrow down to three to five feet for a long bridge. Now every bridge is supposed to have full shoulders despite the increase in cost for obvious I think, reasons. I think it's now 12 feet is the minimum, right? Right. I mean, yeah. you could argue your way to maybe 10, but it has to have a full shoulder yeah. on the right. For that, safety reasons. Yeah, until, you know, until... You need a place to put the disabled vehicles and get them out of the way. Yeah, until this millennium, they they would skimp on that now no longer. I mean, that's not only long bridges. We do small county bridges that don't have full shoulders. Right, but, but I'm talking like interstate standard. Yeah. You used to have that, that exception. Yeah. Definitely not anymore. So the Vicksburg Bridge carries the, the current alignment of US-80 as well as Interstate 20, which connects Dallas with... Uh, the low country of South Carolina. So it's kind of, I-20 is now more or less the replacement of the original Dixie connect, Overland connects Highway. Connects the vicinity of Kent, Texas. With, uh, uh, yeah, or whatever, whatever you want to define that right. as. Right, well, yeah, it's, yeah the, the, the end of I-20 is a little bit in the middle of nowhere. That is true. And I have, Kent, Texas is the nearest settlement. I have been there before, and hopefully I'll never be there again. <laughs> um, I'm going to hope they But here in highway. Vicksburg, it's a, it's a beautiful spot if you're, if you're into bridge photography and droning and all that good stuff um 
I do want to bring up one other thing before we move on from Vicksburg, because I mentioned that there's a lot of Civil War history in this area. There's the Vicksburg National Military Park, which occupies large tracts of land on the Vicksburg side of the river. Huge tracts of land? Yes. Yep. Um, there's also something, if you're on the Louisiana side of the river, there's something called Grant's Canal. Now, the Union tried to get cute in 1862 and they thought well we can we don't need to take vicksburg we can just bypass it and we can just build our own canal in the mississippi river and create our own channel way to so that we can bring our naval ships in and out and screw vicksburg if they're cut off from the mississippi river then it doesn't matter so they tried on two different occasions to build a canal that would basically cut a path between the two channels of the mississippi what what basically is there now was the attempt to cut off you know, what was then a peninsula, you know, in Louisiana. Um, the Confederates knew that the city of Vicksburg and its area was going to be a very significant point of contention. So they saw this coming and laid mines in the river around the Vicksburg area. In fact, one of the Union ironclad ships that was sunk by a mine, the USS Cairo, is actually, it was salvaged after the war and is now on display within the Vicksburg National Military Park. Oh. Um, I did not actually get to see it because you actually, it's actually within the fee zone. So I didn't actually get to see it. But <laughs> Steve's giving the thumbs up. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's, rel- it's in relatively well-preserved condition. And you can go and see that uh, if you'd like. Um, the, the canal was attempted twice. Once in 1862. And then in 1863 they attempted again. In both cases, the project failed. The trench that they were digging flooded, probably by seasonal floods, although that's not entirely clear. Um, And so the project was eventually abandoned, and General Grant decided that the only way to take Vicksburg was by attrition. Um, And that's when the siege of Vicksburg began in the spring of 1863, culminating with the city's surrender on July 4th. However, one section of the originally planned canal is still preserved on the Louisiana side, just off of the I-20 bridge. Uh, And you can go and see that um, today. And so that's that. These are the pictures of the Grants Canal site that I took back in February. And the Connecticut. Yeah, so apparently Connecticut had a pretty heavy hand in the construction of this canal, or the attempt at it anyway. (laughs) And so uh, Connecticut uh, regiment volunteers are memorialized uh, here. I never would have guessed Connecticut, but, you know. Maybe they're master canal builders. You never know. Connecticut's got to be good for something. Well, they're masters at something. (laughs) I don't know what, but. (laughs) The beers. (laughs) (laughs) Moving on. Oh, Down I want to mention river. something. You want to say something? I do want to say something about Vinx, uh, Vicksburg. Do you want us to let you say it? Yes, please. <laughs> so in eight, so what's very interesting is in eighteen, so in 1876, the Mississippi River changed its course, shifting west several miles and leaving Vicksburg without a riverfront. Um, so in 1902, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers diverted the Yazoo River into the old riverbed forming the Yazoo Diversion Canal. And the modern-day port of Vicksburg is still located on this canal. It's just something I thought was really interesting. And if you, like, look at a map, you can kind of see where, you know, how there used to be a huge bend in the Mississippi uh, that went, you know, along Vicksburg and how the Yazoo, Yazoo River was basically, you know, moved, you know, several you know, several miles to form this canal so that Vicksburg wouldn't be um, disconnected from the Mississippi. <laughs> I wanted the awkward silence while we wait for the return of our host. Oh, sorry. Well, why don't no, I just say not, No, it's not your fault. Okay. No, I, I realized too. I just kind of stopped. It's not the new Madrid fault either. <laughs> no, we already. I, right. we're, we're yeah, I mean, I realized I didn't. I just sort of stopped talking without like segueing. But I, but I think that this is this is an interesting point about the movement in the Mississippi River that is you know we've talked about before and. We'll talk about again a little bit later. I feel like we should mention... Oh, I'm back, by the way. 
Oh, <laughs> hey. Uh, I feel like, you know, talking about the changing of the course of the Mississippi, we should kind of segue into the city of Vidalia, Louisiana. Yay. Yeah. Yay. That is the Louisiana side of our next bridge. Um, it's been kind of nicknamed over the years the city of resilience because the settlement that is now Vidalia wasn't there prior to the discovery a... of onions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to work an onion joke in there somehow. Well, may, well maybe, maybe that too, but um, there was a pretty significant event in the lower Mississippi that really changed the history of the Mississippi Delta region, and that is the Great Flood of 1927. Um, Vidalia was one of the ground zero communities for this flood. Uh, the city was inundated during a spring flood of that year that turned out to be a record-breaking event. Uh, Hundreds of thousands of residents were uh, forced out of their homes. The city of Vidalia and many other communities in the Mississippi Delta were inundated. By the way, this is before the days of not just, you know, easy communication with these communities, but also the days before levee systems were in place on the lower Mississippi. Um, So much of the land that was inundated was communities and also agricultural land was inundated. Um, Hundreds of thousands of people in the aftermath of this flood for years afterwards lived in tense cities. Um, The community of Vidalia in particular was relocated about one mile to the south because in the aftermath of the 1927 flood, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers came in, and, and as part of their flood control plan, they wanted to construct a series of levees that would conflict with the current position of the village of Vidalia. And also, they were interested in cutting some uh, paths or cutting some shortcuts in the existing meandering course of the Mississippi River. So some of the oxbows that were created in the Mississippi were man-made, and they were made in the aftermath of the 1927 flood, more as a water control and flood control measure, um, because a meandering path is more likely to spill out of its banks, and also, let's be honest, a more meandering path is more expensive to put levees against, because there's more miles of levees you have to construct. It takes takes longer to traverse. Yeah. So, so when you say Vidalia was one mile north, was it across the Oxford, or was it up on the that I believe it was... It was on the same side of the river. It was just a mile or so upstream. Well, a mile upstream is on the oxbow, and a mile due north is a couple oxbows hence. So. Well, so it was, yeah, it was in, it, it basically is underwater now, in other words. Oh, okay, so, so they, 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 they <laughs> like, cut the river in over it. Basically. So what's okay. now, yeah, there's a name for that that I don't, I think it was called the Natchez Gorge. Uh, that was an artificially made channel. That was cut between yep. two sections of the river to and straighten it out. And that's where it was. Somewhere in that area, yeah. Um, so well, Vidalia that, survives today, sense. although it is not in the location that it was built originally and settled originally. Yeah. The 27 flood had a huge impact on not just culture in the lower Mississippi, but also how engineers approached the idea of water management in the lower Mississippi Delta. Until Hurricane Katrina in 2005, it was the worst natural disaster in the United States history. And we continue to see the effects of the 27 flood anytime you drive on the lower Mississippi, anytime you see a spillway or a flood control structure of any point or at any time on your drive. That was all engineered as a response to the Great Flood of 1927. Hmm. So the bridge here at Natchez was built. We have another cluster of bridges, right? We're starting to see a trend here. Uh, However, these two bridges are part of the same crossing. Uh, The initial bridge that was built here was constructed in 1940. The bridge on the left of the slide, right? It was a two-lane bridge. And it worked relatively well until more modern times when it was decided that Uh, We could use some more capacity along US-84 at the Mississippi River, and so a second parallel span was completed in the 1980s. Right, I mean, and you can tell looking at them that that which one's newer, because it has... um, Shoulders. Well, it it, it also, also, you know, it has uh, more uh, more solid members. It wasn't built, you know, trying to minimize the amount of steel used like a lot of older truss bridges were. Yeah. 
This featured heavily on the Natchez movie. I would hope it did. <laughs> I, I, it I think better I ended have. up walking one of these. T- <laughs> No, well, I don't. Well, I don't know that you can, but yeah. you can certainly drive them. Um, but yeah, these are these are certainly quite impressive. Um, one other mention of the flood of 1927 that I want to get in there is that those of you who are fans of Led Zeppelin, you might be familiar with the song "When the Levee Breaks." <laughs> that is actually a cover of an original country blues song that was written in 1929 by. Memphis Minnie and Kansas Joe McCoy and the lyrics of that song which were largely transplanted to the Led Zeppelin version although they did change some of the lyrics around themselves but the original lyrics uh, depict the events and the hardships and the aftermath of the 1927 flood well and this is a recurring theme with Led Zeppelin a lot a lot of their fairly well-known songs actually are, are adaptations of of older songs, or in some cases, simply traditional songs. They got a lot of their inspiration from blues right, and country, yeah. and then English folk and Welsh folk yep. tunes and all that stuff. Yeah, like a lot of people like to hate the album Led Zeppelin Three, for instance. I think that's a why it's one of their best albums. I th- I agree. I, I think it's... their first eight albums were their best. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, Led Pretty Zeppelin much. 3 is full of folk tunes and all that. I right, think yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Gallows Pole is a folk tune. Hats Off to Roy Harper is entirely a folk tune. That's right, yeah. yeah. It just kind of, when it was released back in the day, it was kind of came out as a shock because it was on the heels of Led Zeppelin 1 and 2, which were more heavy a little, rock. A little, you know? a little bit different in nature, yeah. Yeah, yeah. None of these had Carousel Lomper on it. No. <laughs> Although that is a good track, too. Yeah. <laughs> um... Not a bridge, but I feel like we should spend a moment on an honorable mention here, which is the Old River Control Structure, which, again, as I talked about earlier, the flood control structure is on the lower Mississippi River, whether they be levees, whether they be dams or spillways, they all have their origins in the aftermath of the Great Flood of 1927 and the federal funding that was given to the Army Corps of Engineers um, as a result of that. The levees were, existing levees that were in place at the time were strengthened and heightened. Uh, new spillways were created. Yes. Um, the one that's probably the most prominent and gets most talked about is the one here on Louisiana Highway 15, south of Vidalia. Um, I know a that... It's the Lex worth, it looks like. Uh, it's it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, like, it, but it's much it's much further south than Vidalia, from what I'm seeing. Like, if you take the drive from Baton Rouge up to Vidalia, um, it's in a very remote part of Louisiana. There's really most of Louisiana Highway 15 either runs atop the levee or it runs alongside it. Yeah. So it's an interesting drive from if you're an engineer and you like to nerd out about this stuff. But um, yeah, it's kind of there's really nothing else of. Value it. in this area of the yeah, state. Yeah, it's just a few miles north of Letsworth, which is uh, Louisiana Highway One. Right, it begins at Highway One. Yep. Yeah, this is not too far north from there. So. Which is yeah, right. As part of the construction of the Old River Control Structure, there was a system called the Old River Locks, which were built. Um, the locks were built so that barge traffic could run between. The Mississippi River and the Atchafalaya River, which begins here and runs more or less due south to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the Old River Control Structure is also important to talk about because it is at really the confluence point of three different rivers. I mentioned two of them already. The third river is the Red River, which comes in from the northwest via Texas and Oklahoma, and it flows through Shreveport and Alexandria before reaching the Mississippi River here at the Old River Control Structure. Um, Laura, I know you have a lot of notes on this. I know you probably have a lot that you'd like to say about it. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, well, um, honestly, I feel like you should say your whole piece first, and then I should go, because my notes are, are, I guess, are a Uh, supplement. Well, so the reason why people talk about the Old River Control Structure is it is one of the major exchange points of water between the Mississippi River and the Atchafalaya River. 
and this becomes important when you realize, as we've been talking about, that the Mississippi River over the course of its history likes to change course. And the a river will naturally try to follow the shortest path to the sea, or at least the you know a reasonably shorter path. And the Atchafalaya River is basically right in that path that the Mississippi River wants to follow. Naturally, its instinct is to continue due south rather than curve more to the east towards Baton Rouge. Well, and, and at points in the past, it in fact did go that way. Yeah, I think that the... If you go back like a few thousand years, we're talking like about. The, the, like the Atchafalaya River has its roots in an old course of the Mississippi River thousands and thousands of years ago. Um, but somewhere along the way, the Mississippi changed its course more to the east, and that's the path that it follows today. But it's important to note that the Mississippi nearly changed course as recently as 1973. Um, I was mentioning the Great Flood of 1927. There was another equally devastating flood in the spring of 1973. The control structure here was completed the decade prior. And it didn't take but 10 years for it to become the centerpiece of a drama that unfolded that nearly resulted in the river changing course at the old river control structure. Um, the flow rate of the river was drastically higher than what this control structure could withstand. Uh, the banks of the river started to erode. The construction, the control structure itself began to fail. It's said that the river came within hours of changing course at that point. Um, as fate would have it, the river didn't. The, the flood subsided, uh, and the river still flows through Baton Rouge and New Orleans today. Um, however, in the wake of the flood of 1973, there were additional measures taken. The existing structures were strengthened. An auxiliary structure was completed in 1990, which is what you can see on the top left picture. There's also now hydroelectric power that is harnessed from the old river control structure, and that came online within the last... 15 or 20 years or so. So it was going to go down the chapel ladder. But what is, what kind of emerged from the 1973 flood and the near miss that we had is that the, the permanent change of the Mississippi River to a more southerly chorus along the Atchafalaya Basin is kind of one of those things that's inevitable in the long-term future. And so now it's a question of what to do about that. Um, and I know that Laura, would you like to talk about that? <laughs> I would, yeah. So, um, yeah, as we previously mentioned, the Mississippi, you know, has been flowing on its current course since about 1000 AD, but then beginning in the 1800s, it started shifting more of its flow to the Atchafalaya. Um, and then this um, diversion accelerated in 1831 when um, there was when Henry Miller Shreve dredged a new channel um, and then they cleared out a um, ancient 40 mile log jam of the Atchafalaya. Um, so basically that increased the, the water flow. Um, as time kept going on, the Atchafalaya kept, you know, capturing more and more of the flow. So by the early 1950s, the concern was, oh no, they're not, it's now capturing 20% of the flow. Army Corps of Engineers, was worried it was going to change course as early as 68. So then they began construction in the late 1950s. As we said, 1953 it was when it was completed. And then it almost failed a decade later um, with a huge flood. And there have been um, floods since then. Um, the issue of, um, is that what makes it uh, potentially inevitable is just the settlement buildup and the slope um, build up despite there still still being the old um, river control structure. Right. It, 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 we mentioned it was a shorter course, and that means automatically that it is therefore a steeper course. Correct. Right. And so right, ne right now, it's sort of locked in place where 70% of the flow goes to the Mississippi, 30 goes to the Aptalaya. That was just because that's what the flow was at the time of construction. Um, but basically, the, the question is, what would happen if it failed? So what would happen, the, there'd be three major huge issues. One would be a potential global food crisis. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> well, I think that people don't realize the freight flows of the Mississippi River 
it's the largest inland waterway in the country and you know connects you know it's, it's one it has the largest volume of freight it's some, one of the largest volumes of freight by period in the united states so yeah most of the grain that gets exported from the united states is exported via barge that comes out of the mississippi river right and the yeah. escalaya basin is not prepared to, to take those barges if the river moves construction work would, would be necessary to accommodate that correct right. and so if the move and also if the control structure fails then it's gonna you know <laughs> yeah, it's you well. know avatalaya is gonna have to handle everything all at once and it'd be a huge flooding in Morgan City, a city of about you know ten thousand residents. Destruction also of all of the pipelines, bridges, and rail lines along the way, as well as a loss of fresh water to one and a half million people. And so right now, you know, even yeah, as you'd, recent you'd at, have an energy crisis on your hands too because of all those natural gas pipelines that would be ruptured. Oh my gosh, yeah. yes. So anyway, the the main. The main idea right now, even as recently as the 2017 Coastal Master Plan, basically, you know, makes no provision for any potential failures. It's, you know, oh, the old river control system structure is going to be fine. <laughs> It'll be good. We're just going to keep it, you know, we're going to, you know, do what we can to just make sure a disaster doesn't happen. There's like a 1% chance. But I, you know, was reading about another radical, I, a, a, another idea, which is pretty radical. And when I say radical, I mean very radical because it's a very unpopular idea. You know, what if, and you know, multiple engineers have proposed this, what if we let the Mississippi change channels in a controlled fashion? What I mean by that is, you know, or perhaps over a period of 50 to 100 years. The idea being that it's, you know, this is inevitable. You know, you, if we make up, you know, a congressional commission with all of, you know, the world's professionals, and do this, you know, slow, you know, change of the and uh, controlled um, change of the course of the Mississippi, then maybe we can avoid disaster. Um, and then also, you know, avoid, you know, Morgan City from being completely wiped out. And, you know, also being able to move or strengthen the pipelines, bridges and the other um, infrastructure. Right. And, well, and that, right. That's the other, the other component of that is that that would by nature require... Uh, you know, reconstructing all of the infrastructure crossing the Ashkalaya, um, you know, along with, with, you know, a construction of new levees, new locks as needed and everything, so that when you start sending things that way, it, it's ready for it. Right. right. Now, of course, the issue is that, you know, New Orleans and Baton Rouge would be bypassed and would be devastating to their economies. And to the people living there, and just the cities as a whole. Yeah, um, I think the city can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes. Um, like so, in the in the case of New Orleans, the city could find uh, would they would have to find a new source of fresh water, perhaps from the West Pro River. But it's not impossible. You know, the old New Orleans wouldn't go away. It would, you know, still be a na a national historic and cultural treasure, and a new port city could gradually be built and developed. Well. There, there, there is another issue here that is worth discussing regarding cities going away, and that is, uh, so uh, the Mississippi Delta, and that is the actual river delta on the Gulf Coast, not the delta region of the state of Mississippi, um, uh, you know, is shrinking. Um, now yes. It's shrinking for a couple of reasons. One reason is result of drilling oil out of the ground. Uh, you remove oil from the ground, the ground above it sinks. Funny how that works. Really? Um, no, imagine that. But the other reason is also that, yeah, is that the Mississippi River has had a whole system of levees and locks and everything built along it to control all the flood. Uh, and that means that the, the silt load that is dumped out by the river there is like a tenth of what it historically was. And so the equilibrium of the delta being formed by the river dumping silt while the you know, tides from the Gulf, want, Gulf tend to want to wash it away is upset. And so that also makes it shrink. And so... If you redirected the Mississippi down the Atchafalaya Basin, uh, you would start actually likely growing a bit of a new delta at the mouth of that river, but the one at the, at the, at the existing mouth of the Mississippi would start shrinking even faster. Uh, and New Orleans, before, before, uh, before they knew what was happening, uh, might find themselves actually right on the coast. 
Uh, so <laughs> they expect that now anyway. So yeah, so 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 this this also has you know as far as the the futures of those communities, it also has implications in that regard. Um, this also has has a, a big implication for the fishing industry because the existing uh, end of the Mississippi River Delta is one of the closest places on land to the edge of the continental shelf that you can get you know in North America because it's dumped silt so far out there. So that is that is a major uh, jumping off point for the fishing industry, also for the oil industry. You know, we mentioned they're drilling oil out of the ground. A lot of the, a lot of the pipes from those derricks come ashore in that region. There's also yep. why, you know every time there's a hurricane that hits Louisiana, the price of gas goes up because it takes them a bit to get that back online. <laughs> so there's a lot of things that are that would be very affected by this. It is not just water. Louisiana oh, yeah. has made their bed with the channel of the Mississippi River as it stands, economically yeah. and culturally. And so any change in the river's course as far north as here uh, would be absolutely devastating without decades of long-term preparation. I agree. And as somebody who considers New Orleans one of my most favorite cities ever, <laughs> like, it, yeah. Uh, it, it would it would be a humongous devast. It would you know it would change it would change southern the city it would change southern Louisiana for so many reasons that you know that we can't even like fathom to move them for to move Mississippi. Yeah, it's one of those things that is always kind of out there as a possibility, and. Um... Like I said, Louisiana is banking on this kind of thing never happening. We get to build so many new bridges. <laughs> well, you, yeah, that's one thing you would need more of. We have to yeah. completely redo that yeah. this webinar. Yeah. <laughs> it would be really fun to build those bridges because you wouldn't have to be dealing with coffer dams and existing river. You could build them before the river is there. Well, if you did it far enough ahead of time and you engineered them to accommodate the new channel, yeah, yeah. you can yeah. do that. It actually, you'd actually save money building them if you weren't dealing with water. That's true. So did, you, did we cover everything we wanted to with the... Onward. Yeah, considering it's not even a bridge. Yeah. <laughs> go to it's the, important for the subject, but onward. Let's go to the worst onward. bridge ever. Yeah, so, you know, you're not the only person who would say that. Yeah. Um, mainly because of the traffic that it does carry or it doesn't carry. <laughs> Uh, the, the Audubon Bridge is the newest bridge across the Mississippi in the state of Louisiana. Uh, it was completed in 2011. Now, remember how I was saying that there was a bridge on the Mississippi that replaced the Greenville Bridge as the longest in the United States from the Cable State Department? I found it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we found it, guys. Uh, this bridge was the longest Cable State. It may have even been the longest in North America for a period of time. Uh, with a main span of about 1,600 feet. The bridge is named in honor of John James Audubon, who was a naturalist and painter, um, and who was um, instrumental in the publishing of the book The Birds of America that was published in 1827 and 19, in 1827 and 1839. There we go. Um, this bridge was constructed kind of in the middle of nowhere it's north of baton rouge it's on louisiana highway 10 so it connects the u.s highway 61 what are you doing over there i am attempting to cross ventilate and well open the door then i'm hyperventilating <laughs> you can open, it open it just, just open to one and 10 is appropriate because 61 minus one is yeah, open the yeah. You can open the screen on the on the. Oh look, they let you climb I this bridge. I like that picture. I love how I they let you climb all these bridges with your. Drone. I didn't realize you could get the drone in that close. Yeah, because there's no one on the bridge. <laughs> yeah, well, well you see the can... amount of traffic this bridge carries. <laughs> so, you know, it's. <laughs> you know, I could walk across this bridge. Yes, you could. You probably could. Yeah, without well, seeing another car. Another you know, big thing with drone photos of bridges that is that simply in many places there is it's restricted airspace. You're not allowed to fly mm -hmm. a drone there. This reminds me of the Klein Avenue bridge where I simply just parked my car and got out and took photos because there's no one there and then you turned at the yeah, pole. Yeah, right. No mm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the Audubon Bridge is one of my favorite bridges on the lower Mississippi. Uh, the bridge towers are 520 feet apiece. 
There are 136 stay cables that support the superstructure. And it was constructed at a cost of $410 million, which, considering the amount of traffic that it actually carries, that's it's kind of seen in Louisiana circles as a white elephant because for Ooh, that, no. for that, that's well, a, that's the racially correct term. No. The but what? It seems no? fairly cheap for a bridge of this size. I would have expected that. Uh, well, yeah, I, I guess. Um, oh, it is four lanes. I mean, it is Louisiana, so uh, that's a good point. I'm comparing it to New We're York. We're not. Prices. It's not. It's not New York Union prices, right? Mm-hmm. Well, um, Louisiana is also interesting in that they do have this tendency to, you know, build random four lane roads in places and then just not finish them. <laughs> have it just suddenly end and everyone turn off and go back to the old road. This is not the last bridge on the river that we'll say that about. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Huey P. Long Bridge in Baton Rouge is our next Ooh. stop. Oh, can I make a comment before we leave? The um, John James Audubon Bridge? Yes. <laughs> so it had a very it has it had a very interesting renaming in twenty eleven. What's kind of and it's still kind of confusing to me, but basically, um, it, in twenty eleven House Bill two hundred was proposed in the Louisiana legislator let the yeah, legislator. <laughs> I can't say that word tonight. Legislator. (laughs) Legislative body. (laughs) To rename the bridge, the generals, John A. Lejeune, Robert H. Arrowbridge. Excuse you? They need to make that English. Yeah. So anyway, long story short, you know, there was a compromise that was reached, and per the signed final version of the law... Although the bridge still retains Audubon's name, the east approach to the bridge is officially the General Robert H. Barrow Memorial Approach, and the west um, approach to the bridge is named the General John A. Lejeune Memorial Approach. Hopefully you were not exposed to asbestos when driving the western approach. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because it is the same Lejeune. Um Camp uh, how many Lejeunes are there? There's a camp. <laughs> well, there's a famous camp name for him that's been in the news lately. Right, right. But I, 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 I think anything named Lejeune in the United States is going to be named after the same person. Uh, I would think yeah. so. I uh, mean, I personally like birds. And, you know, I was a really big bird watcher as a kid. And that was something I used to do with my grandfather. So I, it'll always be the Audubon Bridge to me. Well, there are two professional sports teams in Baltimore that are named for birds that I know you like. So That's right. Yeah, you know. So you're our bird fan, I know. And yeah. killed them with the Baltimore Bullets. <laughs> <laughs> That's why there's no wonder we're there. <laughs> anyway. Um, Huey P. Longbridge. We need to spend a minute talking about Huey P. Long, I think. Um, yes. He was the governor of Louisiana from 1928 to 1932, and then served in the United States Senate from Louisiana from 1932 until 1935. He was assassinated at the state capitol in Baton Rouge on September 10th, 1935. Um, One of Governor Long's greatest contributions to Louisiana in general was his... Racism. Understanding... Well, I'm not going to go there tonight. Southerner in the 1930s? No. A, a yeah, southern, yeah, yeah, a southern Democrat in the 1930s, no way, right? Um, one of his greatest contributions, infrastructure-wise, to Louisiana was his understanding of the importance and in investment in infrastructure. Um, he really spearheaded the effort to get Louisiana all the funding it needed for a paved, modern road system. Um, one of his biggest achievements was securing the funding for the two Mississippi River bridges that now bear his name today, this being one of them. This was the second one of the two that be completed in 1940. Also, one of his other pet projects was a direct highway link connecting New Orleans with Baton Rouge that would be built as the airline highway that's now signed as U.S. Highway 61. Um, this bridge carries both road and rail traffic. I mentioned way back when we were talking about the Harahan Bridge, how the roadways were cantilevered outside the superstructure. Well, this is another example of that. Um, it was designed more with rail traffic in mind than highway traffic. 
the other thing to mention here is that the bridge's color has changed over the years quite a bit. Um, when it was opened in 1940, it was painted blue. However, this bridge is located in a highly industrialized area of North Baton Rouge, and so the soot from all the plants that was emitted eventually coated the bridge in a more brown-orange-like color. And after years and years of trying to, you know, remove the dust from the bridge, they just said, screw it, we'll just paint the bridge orange. <laughs> Yay, orange <laughs> which, bridge! Which is, which is what they did until the year 2016, when a painting project was commenced that was completed in 2018, and now the bridge is silver in color. Boo. Which is a more traditional bridge color. The best solution Boo. is um, this, it should this be is orange. Also why UPS uniforms are brown so that you know they can get covered in dirt and you don't notice. I, I, I've never I, thought about no, that. No, that's that's literally I was why. Say it makes sense. That's literally why, yes. I have been to this bridge a couple of times and Was it orange when you were there? I no, it. and I was there before 2016 because in order for me to have photographs on my site, it would have to be before that time. And it was silver years before then, so I don't. I, I have issues with the timing that you present. Well, when I was there in 2017, they were repainting it. Right, they may, have stripped, they may so, have stripped it down to an orange layer that may be some protective layer, but it was well, it was silver when I saw it. Well, okay. In 2010, in 2010. Well, okay. I will. Um, I will say since I've been back there, absolutely fascinating the bridge approach that you watch the rail come in for miles slowly lifting at 1%, and then the road just goes up at 5 or 6%, so you've just got miles of rail climbing as you're still sitting on the ground watching it go. <laughs> yeah, the railroad trestles on both sides of this bridge extend for miles in each direction. And again, that's to maintain the maximum 1% grade that's allowed on railroads going over bridges. Freight trains don't like hills. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, I don't like hills either, so me and freight trains get along. <laughs> Yeah, I do want to. I I do want to note that my notes are similar to Dan's regarding you know the b bridge being be repainted because 2016 was not a good year for me and so I just added that to the list of <laughs> awful things that happened in 2016. <laughs> <laughs> I should have left it orange. I it wanted was to not orange in 2010, so I don't know where the orange came from. Well, whatever. I do want to add one more note regarding Huey Long. Um, that he was instrumental in securing um, FDR's 1932 no nomination, but then split with him in 1933. Um, he was a critic of the New Deal because he proposed his own share of wealth program in 1934, um, basically advocating for massive federal spending, wealth tax, and wealth distribution. Um, but then after he was assassinated in 1935, FDR ended up adopting many of his proposals as part of the Second New Deal. So Huey Long did have an impact um, even after his death on the Second New Deal now, on is, the federal level. This is interesting. I'm looking at Historic Street View 2011. It was rust orange, which is weird because my photos of it weren't, so I don't know. It was, it was probably stripped for several years before they repainted it. But 2008 is red, 2011 is red, but when I went in 2010, it was silver, so I am... Are you sure you weren't at a different bridge? <laughs> I am. Are you I'm sure lost. you were there in 2010? I am lost as to how that changed. I'm going with your pictures are wrong. No, nope, they're definitely not. Google never lies. I know, this is, this, is a, this is a conundrum. Well, while he figures that out, let's talk about the next bridge downriver, which is also in Baton Rouge, the Wilkinson Bridge, which carries I-10. Uh, of all the bridges on the lower Mississippi River, this one is the tallest if you're measuring from deck level down to river level. Um, not by much, but it is. Um, from, I, from deck level, not from, from the top of the river. River. That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. So My clearance, if you will. Yeah. My page yeah. redirected me. I apologize. I am wrong. He was everyone on the wrong else, bridge. Like everyone else is right. There we go. We figured it out. Yep. Yeah, Steve we know wrong. we know that Steve is wrong, so let's just get that out of the way and move on. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, one of the longer <laughs> cantilever <laughs> truss bridges <laughs> in North America. Uh, the center the center truss span is over twelve hundred feet long. This bridge also is a pretty significant bottleneck in I ten, 
for those of you who know the interstate between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, you know that... They're often traffic jams trying to get onto the bridge, yes. Well, if you're trying to navigate, <laughs> particularly on the East Baton Rouge side of the bridge, um, if you're trying to follow I-10 eastbound especially, uh, the interstate main line narrows down to one lane, which is generally not good yeah. for main line interstates, it's especially those in urban areas. Did they change it? Well, the second lane is exit only. That's why. So by definition, that makes it a two lane? Well, that makes it a single, well, it's a single the... through lane through the interchange, yeah. They must have changed that. Well, it You're was... talking about at 110. We already concluded I'm... you're always wrong. <laughs> so... I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this and not seeing it. I'm... Yeah, so 110 comes in from the north and has... I think it's two or three through lanes, but then 110 is basically a ramp at that point. And the right lane is an exit only, and the left lane is the only one that actually merges in. So it's technically only one lane uh, for I see right, right, so, right. So I see where you're talking. The point about here that. is that there is never a point where there is actually only one lane. However, there is only one lane you can follow through the interchange without changing lanes. Yes, I'm, I'm seeing it now. Right. East, and that's, side of, yeah. east side of the interchange where it happens. I was thinking west side, but no, east side. And that's where the 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 traffic jams typically originate in the eastbound direction. And go yeah. all the way back across the bridge. Go all, you, you, Yeah, literally, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you get traffic jams going westbound too. I've sat in one. <laughs> yeah, that that ten one ten junction is a mess. Well, they're they're looking at replacing this bridge now. Well, I don't know about that, but they are oh, looking they are. at doing something about the one ten. No, they're or, looking at this because I know the issues with the approaches being so steep as they are. They're looking at at something entirely new here. This this bridge is just across. Well, they are, so there was a study done by Louisiana DOTD recently about a new bridge, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't be here. It would be further down river. But it would be 10, right? They're just going to move 10. No. Oh, really? I'm talking about down by like Plaquemine. They must have like changed down that. They way. must have changed their focus then. Uh okay. well, they're they're looking into different locations cuz they're they're trying to figure out where if if they can free up this bridge for interstate travel and the 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 traffic more downriver can use the other bridge, then that would take traffic away from this bridge. So mm -hmm. they, they're they're doing a bunch of nonsense right now to try to figure mm -hmm. out. They're they're basically going to end up building another four lane bridge to nowhere. But <laughs> and maybe it'll try and help. Yeah, well, I mean, I feel, yeah. I feel like right. So your your issue is really more the interchange with one ten. If you were able to rebuild that to to you know. You, you would help cons considerably. The bridge isn't really even the choke point itself. It, 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 the solution yeah, I mean, is to build another bridge at the same site. Yeah, the bridge, but I because don't... it doesn't have, it's only two lanes each direction. Oh, it's three lanes each direction. Okay. It is, yeah. Okay, so it does have the extra lane for trucks. I was thinking Newark Bay Bridge with this, but all right, this one, this one. Yeah, yeah but we're, it, we're but not, the we're right not in Newark Bay. Steve. The, we're, we're no, in I'm, will, I'm willing to believe that... we are in Red Stick, which is what Baton Rouge means in French. <laughs> it's literally Red Stick. Great name. But the right lanes, the third lane in each direction, does default to an exit only lane. That that yeah. should be pointed out also. So it's 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 six lanes, yeah, but it's mm -hmm. it's really four lanes plus exit lanes. So really the solution is to build a new bridge at the same site, which I don't know that Louisiana is actually considering at this point. <clears throat> That's what they should do. That that Clearly, we have seen over the years that what should be done versus what is done are often two different things, but I don't know. I'm just the engineer in the room. What do I know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good we have at least one in the room. At least one. At least one. Yeah. 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 So that's the Baton Rouge story. Moving down, now we're between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. We have a couple of bridges along this stretch to talk about. The first up is the Sunshine Bridge. Um, I know Laura's got some stuff to say about this in a second. We'll get to her momentarily. But I want to say it's interesting that Louisiana is weird. And the, the people who draw up these plans for transportation systems in Louisiana are weird. Um, <laughs> you'll notice that on a map, the city of New Orleans and Baton Rouge are roughly 60 to 70 miles apart roughly an hour's drive if there's no traffic on I-10. Yet when 
planning officials were drawing up the grid of highways post-World War II and before the interstate era, there was a plan for something called the Acadian Thruway, which was a highway that would have connected New Orleans, not with Baton Rouge, but with Lafayette, uh, completely bypassing Baton Rouge, the state capital. And I, I still wonder to this day why that would have been the case. Um, one some, of the somebody in Lafayette had a little money in someone's pocket, I'm sure. Well, I guess. <laughs> um, it's usually the case with these things. By the way, Lafayette being one of the capitals of the cultural Acadiana region of Louisiana, yeah. um, so that's probably where it got the name from. Um, the one of the sites that was proposed for a Mississippi River bridge as part of this project is roughly where this bridge is located today at Donaldsonville, Louisiana, um, on Highway 70. This bridge, when this bridge was built in the 1960s, there really wasn't a whole lot of anything here. There wasn't any industry. Uh, it was mostly plantations and agriculture. Um, the state of Louisiana saw this area as a place that could be developed for more robust economic purposes. And so by building the bridge, they were hoping to attract uh, more development to this part of southeast Louisiana between its two largest cities, which eventually did happen. Although when the bridge opened in 1964, that was not the case. This bridge was called Louisiana's Bridge to Nowhere, a title that was inherited by the next bridge we're going to talk about, actually. Um, but anyway, so the, Sunshine, the Sunshine Bridge is a four-lane bridge with no shoulders. Um, its name is a reference to, you know, we talk about political figures a lot. And this one is kind of interesting because, yes, he's a political figure, but he's also kind of a celebrity in 1960s standards. We need to talk about Jimmy Davis for a moment. Um, Jimmy Davis was a country folk singer uh, who rode his celebrity to two terms as governor of Louisiana. Um, we've never heard of any celebrities using their name to you know, run for political office in the no, United States. No, that never happens. That's never happened, right? right? I mean, nobody would run for president on the celebrity <laughs> status, right? Hubert um, was definitely not a celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> but Jimmy Davis was the 47th governor of Louisiana, and he rose to fame in 1940 as, as a singer with his hit song called You Are My Sunshine. Um... I am not going to sing it because you don't want to hear me try to sing it. But I'm if you recognize, if you I'm recognize, gone. you will recognize the tune when you hear it. You Trust me. are my sunshine, my only sunshine. <laughs> you make me happy <laughs> with skies of gray. I give a second photo. <laughs> <laughs> You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. I prefer her rendition. I, I do, however, have to give a shout out to the Marge Simpson rendition of that song. Okay. <laughs> Which does exist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's an interesting example of a song that is technically named, or it's, 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 it's an example of a bridge that is named for a song rather than a person or a geographic feature. How about that? I love it. Well, the Brooklyn Bridge was named in advance of Frank Sinatra. <laughs> There was also, in fact, a band named Brooklyn Bridge. Yeah. Yeah. They were anticipating. <laughs> Laura, did you have anything else you wanted to add on that, or were you... We're saying. Were you good? I mean, I could sing the other verse. No, that's okay. I could sing it with you. We could do it duet. We don't want to get copyright struck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's older than 70... Maybe it's not. No, if, if 49, it's still copyrighted. Uh, well... Until next year, isn't it? No, no, no. But that no, was no, 75 no. years. No, no, no. Well, it's this... 95. 95? Th thank you, Sonny Bono. Thank you, Interstate Oh, really? Florida. I didn't know it was that long. 95, okay. yeah. Oh, jeez. Yeah, we're, we're, we're only putting things from the 20s in public domain right now. Oh, boy. Yeah, and you can, uh, you can thank the Walt Disney uh, Corporation for that. Thank you, Walt Disney Corporation, headquartered at the following address. Boo! <laughs> <laughs> Boo! 
<laughs> but for real, that's honestly, you, you know, when Steamboat Willie came out was what, like 1928? And notice how we're, how, how many years it's taken us to even get through part of the 1920s? <laughs> well, the centennial's coming up, right? I saw it on the Simpsons years ago. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, well, it's not that you can't, you know, like, you know, do a cover or a sample. You just have to, you know, pay and get permission. <laughs> Okay, real Whereas, quick, let's go through the Veterans Bridge, which is the next bridge downriver. Um, crossing the river at the village of Gramercy, Louisiana. Uh, this is one of the newest long span cable state, cable state, cantilever truss bridges in North America. It was completed in 1995. Um, this, if I can fast forward here. Is there a reason they went truss over cable stay? Better. So I think that. There, there are a couple of things here. One is that <clears throat> cable state technology in the early to mid 90s. I think this bridge was planned earlier than that, like late 80s. Oh. Um, it was still relatively a primitive thing. As we'll see with our next bridge, there was a, a living example of a cable stay like nearby. Um, but it's likely that they felt in the moment that they wanted to go with something more proven. Okay. technology wise right well and also um, at, at that point I, I don't think yeah the 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 cable stay fever had really fully took it, taken over yet especially since it is you know a bridge in kind of not a particularly prominent place part of what happens with cable stay bridges now is that uh ever, ever since the new sunshine skyway bridge in florida was built as a uh, actually pretty good looking cable stay bridge uh uh, and it, 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 it's, you know, been copied a million times now. That every, every community, when they want a signature bridge, says, ooh, I want it to look like that. And so now, you know, <laughs> now every community's special bridge all looks the same. And, it, and it's the sort of thing that, you know, while locals who don't get out much don't notice, for people who travel around a lot, it drives you mad. That yes. There's nothing special about this. It looks like a million other bridges. This <laughs> looks pretty special. <laughs> but in this case, there would have not been a reason to make a signature span so they would have simply gone the more functional approach where they did need, you know, they weren't going to build a simple viaduct. They did need something that would give them a, a wide enough span to get over the shipping channel comfortably with, 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 with some good clearance on it. But, uh, you know, this type of cantilever truss structure was capable of handling. And it was cheaper for them to do an entire steel truss than to do something like a suspension bridge. Well, this goes back to soil conditions, right? Yeah, suspension yeah. Was uh, so they decided that so in order building to do, anchorages in this part of the world yeah. is not so great. In exactly. order to do what would be needed, this actually came out cheaper. Most likely, okay. yeah. Well, here's, you'll notice also too, looking at the top there, is is that you have you have it's eye bars, a whole bunch of eye bars. Yeah, it's a very there. conservative, yeah. traditional design, mm -hmm. which is interesting considering how late it is in the cantilever truss canon um so it's a, it's a very similar design to the the wilkinson bridge up in baton rouge and other and other cantilever trusses on lower mississippi so it's it's interesting that they did choose such a conservative design that this late of a stage um but nevertheless that's what they came up with but it it is a bridge in the middle of nowhere even though we're not too far out from greater new orleans at this point um, it is a bridge in the middle of nowhere that goes basically to nowhere. And in fact, true story, when this bridge was opened in 1995, the southern end of the bridge basically was a dead end. You had a slip ramp that would take you to River Road, which is Louisiana Highway 18, for those of you keeping score at home. Um, but that was the only access that you had on the south end of the bridge. River Road, for those of you who have never driven it, is a nice scenic road along the West Bank levee of the Mississippi. Um, it's there to serve local communities, local agricultural interests. It is not there to serve long distance traffic. Is that Highway um, 18? Highway 18. Challenge yeah. accepted. <laughs> the other thing, the other thing with it that so, does make this interesting, yeah, if, you, if you, again, back to the I bars, is you'll notice it's actually only the I bars on that last section before the main pier. Uh, and so normally when you have a truss structure like this, the bottom cord is in tension and the top cord is in compression. Um, I bars are great tension members, not great at carrying compression. What this tells you looking at this, again, room full of engineers here. Um, <laughs> if you haven't already right, noticed. Is, is, is that that last section is actually in tension. And this makes sense when you consider the way it curves up like that. 
So you have that big you know, vertical bit coming off of the support pier, and that first section at least is, gonna, is basically hanging everything from it, while uh, you know, everything else along the, the length of the span uh, you know, the, the normal nature takes over where, you, you know, you put a load on it, it tends to want to sag, which stretches the bottom and pushes the top together, so that's, that's, that's why the rest of it isn't die bars. Yeah. Interesting <laughs> engineering when you actually sit down and break it down, yeah. But yeah, so getting back to the bridge to nowhere thing, so yeah, as I said, the south end of the bridge, or the east bank, quote unquote, end of the bridge, ended at a dead end, more or less. It was not until 2008 that the state highway was extended from that point down to Highway 3127. Um, So there is some connectivity between that highway on the west bank and US 61 and I-10 on the east bank, so it... It has some usefulness now, but I believe it is the lightest traffic bridge in on the Mississippi and Louisiana at this point. And 3089. Or whatever the hell. Yeah, 3127 goes the... one way from the 3089 goes another. Well, 3127 will get you to US 90 and I310 out that yes, way. Yes, it will. So it does have usefulness if you're going out that Alps way. Alps has driven this <clears throat> that road. So have I. <laughs> That's right. I have not. Oh. I haven't been down there yet. Has it made the list? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, here's a bridge that you should put on your list. These are all on my list. Let's just be honest here. Yeah, okay, yeah. that's fair. <laughs> uh, we should talk about... So I was mentioning how cable state technology was in its infancy in the mid-80s, you know, late 80s, roughly, when the Gramercy Bridge was designed. There was a living, breathing example of cable state technology in southeast Louisiana already, and that was in the form of this bridge, uh, which was completed in 1983. Um, There is a certain futuristic look to this bridge that has captivated me since I saw it for the first time, and I will disclose at this point in the presentation that this is my favorite of the Lower Mississippi River Bridges. Um, Yeah, I know. Just get it out of your system, okay? (laughs) Well, right. It is is interesting, too, from the perspective that you look at it, it it, it is relatively few cables. At least, the thing is that they're they're all in clusters rather than spread out. I was noticing the same thing. So it's a little bit of a a different design than you would typically see. It it it, gives it a far more minimalist look. as, As I said, just like Auto Route 19 in Quebec, very similar design, all this is better. Yeah, it's kind of like they went back to the very early beginnings of cable state design with this one. Yeah. Um, it was designed, it would have been designed in the mid 70s. So they wouldn't have that been too, sense, yeah. they wouldn't have been too distant from those examples in the field. Yeah. So they probably, and because this was one of the first cable stays in the United States, I think it might have been only the second one. Well, right. And, of, and of and the long bridge, span and version. And this bridge probably was not built out of prefabricated deck segments. No, that time it probably did. Take given its age and given how spread out the cables are, that's another reason you wouldn't build a bridge like this now. Is because if you had to build a bridge like this now and you wanted to do it in prefabricated sections, you know the the, the entire <laughs> you look at the space <laughs> between the cables. That's how long your prefabricated section would have to be. That's why it's not done like that. We anymore. don't have cranes that are strong enough to lift that. <laughs> oh, you could build them, eh. but it's. Would <laughs> I've worked with more. cranes that big before. To lift that big of a piece? Listen, Maybe. with enough horsepower, you can lift anything. You know what they say about true. men with big cranes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Tell us more, Steve. <laughs> Everyone knows what they say. It's okay. So this bridge is named in honor of Louisiana House of Representatives Congressman Hale Boggs, who served in the House for 28 years between 1941 oh, yeah. Or beginning, there was a period between 1941 and 1972. He died in a plane crash over Alaska in 1972, and his body was never recovered. At least he wasn't killed by the bridge. <laughs> well, well, that's true. We uh, should have an airport named after him. He, he really should. He should have a meteor named after him, or a comet. Something like that. It's worth mentioning that at the time of his death, he was the House Majority Leader. He was also on the Warren Commission that followed the assassination of President Kennedy in 1963. He kind of was someone who followed in the path of Huey P. Long from the 1930s. He recognized the need for investment in modern 
limited access highways in the state of Louisiana. So he really uh, efforted to secure funding for Louisiana's portion of the interstate highway system. Um, the other thing that he he kind of was a bit of a rebel in supporting, considering his political party affiliation, was that he was a strong advocate for the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And, of course, he was... Um, Involved in the creation of the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956, which nice. created, which gave birth to the interstate highway system that we see today. Now, as I said, this is, I just want to take a second to go through a couple more of these pictures because when I was in New Orleans, and if there's ever a road meet in New Orleans, I don't know if there's ever been one down there. Sounds like it's time to plan one. I, I think you're right. Yeah, um, is that the next? Is that going to be the next national meet, Dan? <laughs> oh, you're putting me on the spot here, aren't you? Um, no, Buffalo is the next national meet. Well, that's well, not a, the, well, that's the not next... a two day meet though. That's the yeah. thing. Just a word of advice: if you fly into the airport in New Orleans, you're going to sit on the bus for half an hour getting to the rental car place. Have you I, been, learned, I, I learned this empirically. Have you been through the new terminal? Is that... Yeah, yeah. This well, this this was in. See, Jan... I haven't been through the new. This one was in yet. January of 2020 that I learned this empirically. Oh boy. That they the new terminal was open, and I was like, oh, this has got to be temporary until they open the new rental car center, right? Right. And then I learned, no, actually, they don't intend to open a new rental car center. They're going to just leave it like that. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. So oh, boy. the rental right. car center is was walking distance from the old terminal. Yeah, I remember <laughs> just being able to walk. But now down it's the... now it's entirely on the other side. So you got to take a bus all the way around. Oh, jeez. What, like Atlanta or Houston? No, no, no. Atlanta, you don't take a bus to the rental car center. They have a, a, a mini like. You rail take the light rail. rail. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But it's all the way at the end. Of... You well, still need to like take a public transportation mode to get it, there. It, it, well, that's most yeah. airports. You have to take some gate, sort gate of transit. To, gate to rental car is faster in Atlanta than it is in New Orleans. New York oh, jeez. Yeah. Never rent a car so as I said, you know, this is my favorite of the Lower <laughs> Mississippi <laughs> River bridges, and. This was one of my favorite money shots from the whole photo shoot. Um, it's once you're this yeah. far, once you're this far down river, it's very difficult to get pictures of these bridges without ships and barges photo bombing the proceedings. Um, you couldn't stop so. traffic to take a picture. Yeah, so this, uh, you know, I don't think I have a. <laughs> well, way to it's do a that. feature of the photo. I yeah. Photoshop like this one out, but the one in the back of the cable is kind of stuck there. It's a feature of the photo. It it it, it looks better with it there. <laughs> I agree, and I love this bridge too. I I it's, it's a great photo, great bridge, great photo. everything. Makes the bridge look important. Now there's well, yeah. there's a lot going on underneath it. That's for sure. Um, I also want to bring up one other thing. Um. Construction of the bridge began in the mid 1970s, but it was not completed until 1983. During the construction and in the years leading up to that, there was a ferry service that connected the cities of Luling and Destrehan on the opposite sides of the river at this point. One of these ferry boats, named the George Prince, was struck by a, uh, a freighter that was moving downriver. Um, in the early morning hours of October 20th, 1976. The ferry was carrying 96 passengers at the time of the collision. The ferry boat uh, sunk. Uh, 78 people perished in the disaster, which remains the deadliest ferry disaster in United States history. Um, in 2009, the memorial that you're looking at in the pictures here was dedicated to the victims of the disaster. Um, all 78 names of the people who perished are listed here. And as a bit of a posthumous commentary, it was, dis it was discovered in the inquiry to this disaster that the boat captain was inebriated at the time. Oh, and so it. this... The freighter or the ferry? The ferry. And so this brought about a number of safety changes in U.S. ferry regulations, including regular drug testing for boat captains. Mm -hmm. Among other different changes, shift, you know, shift changes. There were, I think, a few people who testified that some of the crew were sleep deprived as well. So this brought about changes in that regard as well. But it took a disaster of this magnitude to affect federal level change. And it would be their fault, too, because as the much smaller boat, they would be the ones expected to yield to the barge. Yeah, well, the, yeah. well go back to this picture here. You're, you're, you're telling me that you're going to get wisdom that freighter to stop. The ferry. The ferry you, wisdom, wisdom line ain't going to stop in time. Right. Sorry. <laughs> um, 
so yeah it was discovered in the inquiry that there were some really unfortunate circumstances going on behind the scenes and again it's a shame that it took a disaster like this to bring all that stuff to the forefront and improve the standards that we now know and i'm sure that we take for granted whenever we ride a passenger ferry But by the way, this uh, this memorial is on the Luling side of the bridge, so this is on the East Bank side of the river. Um, it's open to the public; you can go and visit it. Um, it's open during the day, and it's it's worth checking out if you're interested in transportation history in southeastern Louisiana. I think it's a, at least for me, it's a mandatory stop. All right, we talked about one bridge named for Huey P. Long. Let's deal with the other one. Your other Huey P. Long, really. The one that I actually meant to talk about. <laughs> yes, yes. The, 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 not, not to get confused here, there are two Huey P. Long bridges in Louisiana. Both of them are cantilever truss bridges that carry a railroad in the middle with longer approaches and roads on the outside. Both of them also carry a road that's, that's numbered something to do with 90. U.S. 90. So... <laughs> That don't, was my... it, 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 don't get confused by that. <laughs> one of them may have been orange at some point. There's not this one. This one? No, yeah, no. No, but this bridge did receive a huge makeover, though. Um, the bridge that exists today is hardly the structure that was there in 1935 when it opened. Yep. And that's kind of the remarkable story of this particular structure. The original steel cantilever structure only encompass the railroad portion. Remember how we were looking at the Huey Long Bridge in Baton Rouge, how the superstructure of that just encased the railroad and you, section. you could tell very easily here with the different beams in the middle versus the outside. You kind of had a similar setup on the original layout of this bridge, except the roadway on this bridge was even narrower than that one was. I think officially they were listed as 10-foot lanes, but I call BS on that, and I say they were more like 9 maybe eight and a half in places we're we talking manhattan bridge now so trucks were so it's been told to me that trucks couldn't pass each other on this bridge because of the curves there, there were much sharper curves in the roadway also leading up to the superstructure so that combined with the narrow lanes meant that trucks couldn't pass each other uh and so that was a traffic disaster for a number of years it wasn't until 20 I think it was 2006 when construction actually got started on the roadway improvement program, which saw the, the widening of the steel superstructure, which you see on the picture on the left. Right. Anything that is not over the central portion with the Huey P. Long Bridge plaque on it, that's the original steel. Everything on the flanks is new. That's a new addition. Well, and this was still ongoing at the beginning of 2009 when the AA Roads Forum was new because I remember there being a big thread talking about it. It was a big deal yeah. because a lot of people just yeah. talked about building a new bridge and for the highway and retaining the original bridge for the railroad. But they didn't want to commit to building a, a parallel bridge at the same site. They felt that the original foundations were in still pretty good condition to support the widening of the existing bridge. So that's what they decided to do. And it was a landmark project because there weren't that many examples of a bridge that was this heavily modified and yet comes out being the same structure at its core. It's interesting um, how they extended the Piers, too. Yep. Yeah, you notice yep. how this, the piers are kind of cantilevered outwards. So they kind of had to widen the footings that go down into the river, but then that only worked to a certain point. So they had to cantilever them outwards on these steel beams that jut outwards to support the new roadway. Really interesting engineering that went into this. And when I was working with Tappan Zee Constructors, I worked with a couple of people who were on this project. Mm. And... Some of the stories they told about some of the means and methods that they had to use to mm -hmm. to do this. Because remember, they had to keep the existing bridge open this whole mm -hmm. time to both railroad and roadway oh. traffic. Yep. So they had to like shut down half of the bridge and remove half of it. But by removing half of it, they risked bringing the bridge out of yeah, balance. Yeah, so they yeah, had yeah, to yeah, put, yeah. Well, this is the other they had thing to put right. temporary measures in place to keep the bridge in balance while they right. rebuilt the other yeah. side. It, it was a mess to do that. and But they did it. And the resulting project was really... It's really a masterpiece of what you can do by taking a pre-existing bridge that's substandard and making it really... You know, worthy of the 21st century, I would did say. They, did they apply any national awards to this? 
I think they did. I think I there were... Yeah. I, the project was completed in 2013. I remember seeing a, a um, webinar on this about widening a structure like this. Yeah, it's a very it's rare thing. Yeah. And again, it's tenuous because you're trying to keep it open while dealing with all the issues that come up with building you know, new steel into a structure that's already existing. Um, so yeah, it, it was a really interesting project, and they did a great job with it. Like I said, if you look at this bridge today, you would just assume that that's how they always built it. You wouldn't know that it was a completely different structure like 15 years ago. It's incredible. Thank you. <laughs> By the way, I was talking about ships photobombing bridge photos. Here's another example of that. <clears throat> All right. I see no ships. Let's talk about New Orleans as we finally reached our southernmost bridge on the lower Mississippi River. Yay! This is, this is the one I mentioned before that was told into the 21st century. You are correct about yeah. that. Yeah. Well, then, because I, I first took this with my parents, that means that I was on it when it was told, but I didn't know that. You didn't pay the toll, though. Definitely not. By the time I, <laughs> by the time I drove it, it was very much not told. That's right. It's coming out of his inheritance, though. He's keeping track. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't think the toll on this bridge ever got higher than a dollar. And it was only charged going into downtown New Orleans. That's the other thing. Oh, yeah, we went the other way. If you drove it outbound, you wouldn't have paid a toll even back in the day. I didn't drive it inbound until this, maybe it was last year, but very recently. Yeah. So the Crescent City Connection is the name of the bridge. That was was not always the name of it. Um, The planning of this bridge goes back to the 1940s and the years after World War II. And... When we do our webinar on New Orleans, which is in development, and it'll be done at some point because it's one of those cities that I really want to profile, this rendering that you're seeing on screen is going to be pretty significant in the proceedings because basically everything that we see freeway and bridge-wise within the city of New Orleans has its real starting point with the master plan for the city that was published in 1946. It was published by a gentleman you might be familiar with named Robert Moses. I was going to guess that. Who was, in the 1940s, he was a bit of a household name. He was a rising star nationally for all the work that he had done in New York City in the 1920s and 30s. And so other cities across the country commissioned him to do studies on what they should do for you know, the post-World War II look of their cities, you know, in the, in the way of quote-unquote urban renewal and freeway construction and easily easy access to the downtown business district. Um, New Orleans was no exception. This study was published in 1946, and it included this rendering, which is interesting to note. Um, it included a bridge on the Mississippi River, which is basically the bridge that we got in the 1950s, um, minus the helix. Minus the helix, which Ooh. in my opinion was the best part. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a badass uh, drive to to take that. But um, there's other stuff on here that we can get into more detail on with the New Orleans webinar. You see the Riverfront Expressway. You see the highway that leads away to the top left corner of the rendering that was eventually built as what's called the Punch Train Expressway, which is US 90 Business and I 10 heading out towards Jefferson Parish. Um, but the right, bridge well, was the Claiborne is not in this image. That is true. Yeah. That yeah, that's <laughs> New Orleans webinar, folks. We'll spend plenty <laughs> of time getting into that one. Um, but the bridge was central to the whole scheme of the New Orleans freeway grid in the years after World War II. Construction on this bridge began in the mid 1950s and was completed in 1958. The bridge was known as the Greater New Orleans Bridge. And that's the name that it carried until the early 1990s. It carried two lanes of traffic in each direction. There was also a center median in this bridge that was, I guess it would have been used as a mutual breakdown lane for both directions of traffic. I can't imagine that that would have been a safe arrangement. I guess it sounded good in the mid 1950s. Um, Tapping Z. The, well, you know what? I'm, that's another example of that. Yeah, yeah the original Tapping Z was six lanes, three and three, with a center of with a center median for yeah. breakdowns yeah and really the castleton bridge today is still that setup i think 
I don't think they've got rid of that. The, I thought fire. the middle lane is reversible for traffic there. I don't think it's a breakdown. No, no, they never did that. I think really? I think it's still. Castleton does not have a reversible lane, no. No, it's 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 two and two with a center yeah. mall that's open. Yeah. So that's that's kind of the arrangement that the original oh, I ninety. The the Berkshire Spur ninety. Yeah. Or whatever you call it. Yeah, that. that yeah. 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 Um <laughs> so the GNO bridge had that set up. Now the GNO was designed at a time when there really wasn't a whole lot of anything on the west bank of the Mississippi River. There was Algiers Point, which was the fifteenth ward of New Orleans. It was the only ward within Orleans Parish or the city of New Orleans. They're both synonymous. Um but with the bridge there uh, suburban sprawl happened, which, you know, imagine that. That's never happened in any American city post-World War II. The, the original GNO bridge was, in the subsequent years, overwhelmed with traffic, mainly because of the feeder routes that led into it, the West Bank Expressway, uh, General de Gaulle Drive, Terry Parkway, among others. They all fed into the bridge at its east end, Compass East, because it's important to note that <laughs> so if you're driving US 90 business it's important that you ignore the control <laughs> cardinal directions on the road because if you're going westbound on business 90 you're actually going due east over the Mississippi River yep. before the highway wraps around on itself and mm-hmm. takes a more westerly track yeah, once well, it's right, on the other right. side the, of the, the river the river is very meandery here so you know if you mm-hmm. ask in in you know, it, it, so so I'm in New Orleans. Is the river southwest or east? The answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. well, that's why they call it the Crescent City, right? Okay. Yeah, it's surrounded by water, basically. Yeah, you don't use directions in the city. You use river-based directions. Yeah, so one of the things that happens, you'll hear on the local traffic reports on, say, WWL radio, they'll talk about, especially with the Pontchartrain Expressway, they'll talk about if you're going river-bound on the expressway or if you're going lake-bound on the expressway. There you go. Yeah, to get around the east-west yeah. nonsense. Yeah. Um, that's, again, something else we should get into with the, the New Orleans webinar. But the original GNO bridge um, wasn't cutting it anymore for traffic. There were studies done in the 1970s about new locations for another bridge at New Orleans. The most promising of these alternate sites was a site that would have put the bridge somewhere on the New Orleans side of the river at Napoleon Avenue, Um, but that never really gained enough traction to see construction and final design. Ultimately, it was decided to put a parallel bridge near the current site, and this parallel bridge was constructed between 1978 and 1988. Um, It's worth noting that when they were planning the parallel span here, it was discovered during soil exploration in the late 1970s that they couldn't locate this parallel span closer than 400 feet to the existing bridge. And the reason for that is because of the disturbance of the soil that would have been caused by the, the mm-hmm. placement of a new foundation would have unsettled and destabilized mm-hmm. the settlement they were destabilized the foundations of the existing bridge. Yeah, so you're, you're, <laughs> some of you may remember what happened that time to the I-495 bridge near Wilmington, where it started to lean because someone piled too much dirt up. Oh, uh, yep, yep. Yeah, so, so it's, just, it's the same exact principle at play here. Um, that, that basically, when, when you have a lot of these fine-grained, you know, wet clay soils, that uh, they, they don't consolidate very quickly. Uh, so when you put... I don't know, a support on it, it yeah. you know, it basically, you know, creates a dimple in it. <laughs> uh, that grows all the over weight. time, yeah. But that when you when you put more weight next next to it, that'll start to create its own dimple yeah. and it'll start to push what's what's next to the existing support down further. And yeah, it can make it start to lean <clears> if you put it too close because basically basically what would happen would have happened if you tried to put the new bridge right next to the old one is that the weight from the new bridge would have caused the soil under the support of the old bridge to start to sink on one side. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, we have engineers in the room, okay? So, <laughs> but that is that is the technical explanation of it, yeah. And so they couldn't locate the bridge closer than it is, basically. Yeah, it, it, t- it does kind of look like the two could be closer together. There are parts, there are, there are parallel spans on the Mississippi River further north of here where they are closer together, but 
they did do the planning and discovered that because of the poor soil conditions that they had to locate the parallel bridge where they did. That bridge was completed in 1988. It was completed as part of a much larger program in Greater New Orleans uh, that also involved the, the widening of the Pontchartrain Expressway from the river down to Claiborne Avenue, the construction of the Claiborne Flyover, which more directly connects I-10 with Business 90 and the bridge, and also the completion of the elevated West Bank Expressway, which runs westward from Algiers, out through Gretna mm. and Morero, and out towards West Wego. It Wego's. is not completed. Yeah, towards a place called West Wego. Fun how that works. It is not, <laughs> it is not completed. There is right-of-way left in the median to extend it all the way down at some point. Well, right, yeah. the intention is for that to be I-49. Now it is, but originally yeah. that land was still there for it to be extended around. That never happened. Yeah. Yeah, the original West Bank Expressway was an at-grade uh, divided highway, and they... Through West Wego, they took the time to actually move the roadways out, I think, but they never actually built the elevated structure right. to complement it. So that is the story of the two bridges. Now, where does the name Crescent City Connection come from? I was going to raise um, one more thing in the story. The, the bridge on the right has an extra little roadway attached to it. Well, I'm going to get to that. Okay, so we're not there yet. Got it. Okay. Um, where does the name Crescent City Connection come from? It, it came from a naming contest. Right. After the... Parallel Span opened in 1988. There was a public naming contest in Greater New Orleans to rename the now complex, quote-unquote, of bridges. And the name Crescent City Connection was the winning entry. There were a bunch of other different entries. I don't... I think there's somewhere online that you can go to actually find what the other nominees were. Some of them were cute. Some of them were just made up by nitwits and dopes out there. Um... Bridgie McBridgeface was not one of the finalists. <laughs> I was going to say, I would have um, expected something way more clever. <laughs> well, but, right, uh, this, this, would have, this would have been before most people had internet access, so it wouldn't have been interneted like some of those things were. Yeah. If you're ever really bored, look at the name of the snow plows in Michigan. They Every did one each of, year. They, they do that, and they all have, like, the most creative names. Of oh, actually well, in fact, not just Michigan. Other places do that, too. Oh, do they? Yeah. Michigan's the one I've yeah. seen. So in Baltimore, we had contests for naming our trash wheels. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> but I want to just throw McTrash out there. <laughs> I think we have Mr. Trash Wheel, Professor Trash Wheel, and what's the other one? Why am I drawing a blank? I don't remember. But what I do, I do another random factoid I want to throw about the naming of the bridge is that um, it's also commonly known among local Vietnamese Americans as the Pelican Bridge due to blue signs at either end that feature a pelican from the state flag. And I'm not going to attempt the name of the Pelican Bridge in Vietnamese because Vietnamese is a tonal language. So I know I will 100% pronounce it wrong. <laughs> yeah. So the the pelican, the pelican is the state bird of Louisiana. And there is there are plaques on each end of the original bridge that have the pelican on the on the placard. So that's so that's where the name comes from. I would also like to talk about the HOV roadway, which should be mentioned here. Um, the parallel bridge that was built in the '80s incorporated the reversible HOV roadway that you see. If we're looking at this slide right here, it's you can see it on the left-hand side of the right-hand bridge, which is the newer of the two. Um, back when this bridge was conceived, commuting patterns into New Orleans were vastly different than they are now. I think that somebody in the chat mentioned, and they mentioned rightfully so, that a lot of the corporate core of New Orleans has left in the last 40 years. Um, precipitated by the oil bust of the 1980s, but there have been other factors that have been in play since then. A lot of West Bank commuters used to go downtown. They don't anymore. Um, and the HOV roadway that was built into the parallel bridge was designed to help you know, carry some of that traffic into the central business district that really doesn't go there anymore. So what you end up with is a is a valuable piece of real estate, you know, two freeway standard lanes of bridge on the Mississippi River that are relatively unused compared mm -hmm. to the general lanes on the two bridges as they stand. Um, this is... Well, because to use it, you not only need to be going that way, you need to have multiple people in your car. Yeah, so that's another thing. So it appears that the city of New Orleans has just decided to stop enforcing the HOV. 
<laughs> um, they are still signed as HOV lanes, but there has never been any HOV enforcement, at least in recent years, on those lanes. Um, and they, they don't want to flip them around to run them the other. I guess. Well, they are reversible, time. so it's. But, is that, but I mean, like you could do morning into West Bank if there was enough demand there. I take it there's just well, demand in general is just not there. Well, right. I think the point is is that the 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 uh, peak hour flows on the bridge are, are, are not as as directional as they once were. And they're not to the level that would right. require... A lot of people in the West Bank are commuting now to Jefferson Parish. So they're mm-hmm. either taking this bridge to I-10 to go west, or they're taking the Huey Long Bridge up to Metairie. They're not going to be wanting to take the HOV, which only takes you to downtown. You can't get to I-10 from the HOV lanes. It dumps you off onto the local streets. Which, right, that's, that's, that is another limitation of it, is that, yeah. right, if you take the HOV lane, you're basically committing to getting off and going downtown. It is not usable right. for a road. So in the 70s, when oil companies, I think Shell Oil had a, had a headquarters in New Orleans, and there were a few others that had significant office space downtown, people from the West Bank were likely commuting downtown over the bridge. but And that's why they designed the HOV into the new bridge. But in the years since then, New Orleans has shifted. The oil industry capital of the Gulf has shifted to Houston, not New Orleans. So there's a cultural and commuting shift that's happened in the years since then that has really rendered the original HOV layout obsolete. Uh, spoiler alert that I'm sure we'll talk about when the New Orleans webinar happens, but there is a proposal. I think it's at the city council level as we speak in May 2023 that part of the plan is to utilize the HOV roadway as part of a new bus rapid transit system. Ooh! Why it to autonomous vehicles? Because it would still well, be used. Well, <laughs> so there, there, is, there is a recognition that the HOV is heavily underutilized and ought to be more utilized than it is. Um, stay tuned on that. Yeah. I do want to throw out there because I'm sure just everybody was absolutely wondering about the tra- Baltimore Trash Wheel family. Their, na- <laughs> their names are Mr. Trash Wheel, Professor Trash Wheel, Captain Trash Wheel, and Gwenda, the Good Wheel of the West. <laughs> okay, we have our winner. <laughs> yeah, it's hard not to pick that one as a winner, right? The other three yep. are all the same name. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, that was definitely from a naming contest. And Gwenda references uh, the Gwyn, um, Gwyn's Falls. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That is it for the existing bridges. Um, there's one more topic I want to touch on, and this is something else that I'll bring up also in the uh, in the New Orleans webinar when we get to it. Um, the great and powerful Shandor is responsible for the creation of you know the color coding of this map, which is in the Louisiana State Archives, as far as I'm aware. And does not include the West Bank. So that's so that is a little bit of the backstory behind what this is. Yeah. Now, at the same time that officials were planning a new bridge on the Mississippi to complement the what's now the Crescent City connection that would have crossed the river at Napoleon Avenue, there was another competing proposal, or perhaps it was an independent proposal, um, to build yet another Mississippi River bridge further downriver. However, this one was planned as part of a much larger idea to build an outer bypass of Hence Greater New Orleans. Hence the 410 shield on your 310 Yeah, you noticed that, didn't you? And we didn't go into a lot of We didn't, yeah. but we're going to yeah. go into it now. So um, what exists of Interstates 310 and 510 on the flanks of Greater New Orleans were built in the 1970s and 80s as part of a larger plan for a circumferential highway around the southern fringes of the metro, um, which would have been numbered Interstate 410. It was approved for inclusion into the interstate system. Wow. Um, the long story short on this is that the idea, while it was a good one, ran into a lot of environmental obstacles in the 1970s. The project was officially canceled in 1977. However, in addition to the existing pieces of it that were built, the 310 and the 510, we also have these alignments that were that were studied for a new Mississippi River bridge connecting far downriver Algiers with St. Bernard Parish in the area of Chalmette, 
which is over in this area, and also Moreau down in this area. A lot of different alignments were studied. The preferred alignment was selected in the mid-1970s. That's this brighter green alignment that kind of splits the difference here in the proposed alignments. So you would have had a bridge crossing the Mississippi River in the area of where the industrial or the intercoastal waterway comes in to the Mississippi River um, at the far compass southeastern corner of, of Algiers in Orleans Parish. Um, this is as far as they got planning wise. There is no known final design that was ever done for this bridge. So we don't know exactly what it would have looked like. However, we can reasonably <laughs> we can reasonably assume that it would have taken the form of one of these bridges. It would have been of a scale similar to the Crescent City Connection. It would have been of a size similar to the Hale Boggs Bridge on a 310. Um, and it would have probably been taller than either of these because it's further downriver from those two. Um, it's also possible that the surrounding highway, Interstate 410, would have been built as part of a larger flood control project. You know, including dikes and dams and levees and that sort of thing to protect the southern rim of New Orleans Metro from coastal flooding from hurricanes, which, of course, as we know, came to a head in 2005 with Hurricane Katrina. Um, the hur that hurricane, of course, inspiring over 15 billion dollars in investment in stronger flood walls and flood protection systems. Um, parts of New Orleans continued to be vulnerable to flood protection. Um, combined with sea level rise and also the subsiding of the land in New Orleans, uh, parts of New Orleans are settling at a rate of about two inches a year. Um, further flood control measures are likely going to be needed in future years. And I've often wondered if a revitalization of this idea might kind of go towards that. If you built the highway, kind of like what the Dutch do, like in the Netherlands, they build their highways on top of flood control well, systems right. and, and the, all they, that. They, the thing is, even the Dutch have stopped doing that because they've kind of come to the realization that, wait, we build this now, uh, it's going to be underwater pr probably before the end of its service life, so uh, might want to hold back on that. <laughs> yeah. So, but the idea of ringing the southern flank of New Orleans with a, si with a series of levees and dikes and water control systems is not that outrageous an idea. Parts, parts of the system that have been built in the years since Katrina have been declared already, 15 years out, to be inadequate to protect against the 100-year storm that they were originally designed for. Plans have been, in subsequent years, been released for stronger steel defenses for New Orleans. However, at a price tag of at least $50 billion, it's very unlikely that the city of New Orleans will ever see more than a drop in the bucket compared to what they're actually asking for. Um, so it remains to be seen. New Orleans is competing with other cities on the Gulf Coast, mainly New York, Miami, uh, Galveston, Houston... You said New York for well, funding for sea level rise and flood protection measures. Well, and, I mean, and it is unlikely that a city like New Orleans, which has been recently relegated to second rank, at least in terms of the oil industry, is ever going to see nearly enough protection or funding for the protection that they're asking for. Right. Well, and, and this is part of the struggle with New Orleans in general, is that uh, while it is a culturally important city, it is, in current America, not actually that economically important a city. Mm -hmm. So in terms of actually getting money invested in it, it's, it, you know, it mm -hmm. does tend to, to, to fall behind places like Houston and New York, which, right, which, which are more economically important. Um, you know, and, and also, as far as uh, you know, funding in the wake of disasters goes, you know, it, it's always about the latest one, right? I mean, Katrina was, at this point, 18 years ago. Uh, you know, there, there's now a lot of federal money going at Puerto Rico uh, <laughs> because, yeah. because, because they uh, got really damaged by a hurricane much more recently. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's and, and yeah, and that'll probably dry up the instant there's a next huge hurricane that wrecks somewhere else. So, on, on, you know, on goes the march. <laughs> yeah. So every once in a while you do hear about people maybe thinking about reconsidering the idea of at least another bridge 
further down river from the Crescent City connection that would mainly serve the West Bank and St. Bernard Parish and connect those two areas more directly with I-10 in New Orleans East, which would undoubtedly relieve some of the congestion on I-10 through New Orleans proper. Um, but the larger question here is, you know, feasibility moving forward in terms of, you know, the, the flood protection of this part of Louisiana and whether this idea would be more appealing if, it, if flood protection measures were incorporated into it. I don't know that we would ever get to a point in America where we would want to sit down and have that discussion, but it's a discussion that the engineer in me is willing to have. Um, now there's one in you. Yeah, well, you know, I, th these are the things that I think about. You know, these are my fictional highways. You know, everybody in, everybody in road enthusiasm has their own fictional highway that they would like You're to see You're not just build. an engineer. There's also um, an engineer in you. Absolutely. Interesting. Well, you know, I have a resume, so it comes from somewhere. So, okay. um, yeah. But, um, yeah, so this is, and this is something that we'll dive into much more um, in the New Orleans webinar. But when it comes to flood protection and vulnerability and the cost of climate change that is really starting to bite, especially in southeastern Louisiana, uh, there are no easy solutions for anywhere along the coast, especially New Orleans. And with that, I say thank you for watching. You forgot a bridge in this picture. You no, it's, it's behind the boat. Yeah, so this, <laughs> Under the boat. So this picture is taken, so it, where the drone is positioned, if you panned directly behind the drone, you're looking at Jackson Square in the French Quarter. And off to the right, you see Algiers Point, which is, again, the 15th Ward of New Orleans. Um, by the way, this, where, where, where that freighter is positioned right there, that is basically the deepest point in the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. um, it's been measured. It depends on, you know, silt buildup and all that, but it's, it's been measured to be over 200 feet deep at that point. Yeah. Wow. Yep. And, of course, we're looking downriver towards the Gulf of Mexico, which I think is about 70 river miles away from this point. Yeah, it's, it's actually, it, right, you can drive all the way down. It's a long drive down to the end of the delta there. Um, also, you can drive to the village of Venice, which they like to call the end of the world, because it is <laughs> literally the end of the um, Mississippi River, yeah. Which is the world. The river. For them, it is, yeah. It is also worth noting that while, right, while the Crescent City connection is the furthest downstream fixed connection, there are a couple of ferries... Uh, across the river in the delta, the actual delta. Ew, ferries. But, but nah. well, right, and, <laughs> and, and and those are unlikely to be replaced with bridges because they don't get nearly enough use to justify the expense, and um, you know because of the shipping, you would need to spend a lot of money building a very, either a very high level bridge or a movable one. But the problem with a movable bridge is that there's enough traffic is that it would spend a lot of time in the raised position. So yeah, <laughs> right. So yeah. so you're better off just having the ferry at that point. So right. So so yeah. and, and 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 you see this in other places along the Gulf yeah. Coast too, where there are places where there's, a, where there's a the ferry house. simply because uh, you would need a high level bridge to accommodate shipping traffic, and there isn't enough, and there isn't enough automotive traffic to justify the expense of a high level bridge. Right. Well, I am going to. Let's see. I'm going to take a breather for a few minutes here. Um, Smoke if you got them. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not going to do that, okay? That, that's counter to breathing. <laughs> I said if you got them. W -W. Mm. Yeah. Nobody's got them. Don't smoke, kids. <laughs> Since we were talking about the Crescent City Connection HOV lanes, I thought that we would start with a video of that as we shift into the video par portion of the program. Oh, is this, is this why you know it's not enforced? <laughs> Well, that, that's part of the reason. Uh, enjoy this trip. I gotta step out for a minute. Bye. Bye. Hi. You want to say hi to everybody on Ruby Biz? Hi. Hi, Rainy. Rainy, but it's only cloudy in the video. <laughs> I'll keep the video. Mm. <laughs> well, I'm going to get her to bed, so I'm going to sign off. Oh. We'll miss you. Well, uh, we will miss you, too. I think if you were here in Maryland, you could hear some bedtime stories. Yes. 
<laughs> of which we have many that are transportation themed. Yes. <laughs> We are, we are all here for you. Bring it on up. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, we're going to sign off. Say good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> good night. Wait, can one push the red button? You want to push the red button? Okay. So I, I do see some flashing lights here, but they're not in the HOV road. Right? That's why he's on the HOV. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. 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 A lot better. There we go. Okay. <laughs> You were commenting on the Orleans Parish car, right? <clears throat> well, this 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 appears to be a truck of the fire variety. <clears throat> Wait, <clears throat> people are going to see you standing in front of the TV. <clears throat> <laughs> hmm. And that would do it. A, 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 either okay, one of those vehicles likely rammed into the other, so something went <laughs> crunch. One <clears throat> of those vehicles ran to the other. One of those vehicles just didn't belong. Yeah. Just didn't yield. <laughs> well, now you still have the problems in those lanes. Yeah, well, they don't have that song on Sesame Street anymore. <laughs> oh. We're not supposed to be different than each well, other. Well, yeah, right. Oh You're no, not, it's not. It's we're, we're not. Spo we're supposed to not. No, not that, that, that no, that's actually why is because they decided that you know the, a message about something not belonging because it's different wasn't a positive. Message. But you are supposed to figure out what it is by the end of the song. <laughs> um. Man, this makes you want to take the HOV lens next time in New Orleans. Have you not been on the HOV, Steve? No. Yeah. It, it's actually a really interesting drive. I um, mean, the last time... Uh, first of all, you have to figure out how to get on there, well, <laughs> which was not near where I was, and then the, going the other way it just wouldn't have been open when I was going. Yeah, because as I said, you can only access the HOV from the local streets on either side. Yeah. You, there, well, there is actually a ramp to the West Bank Expressway in both directions, but... Yeah, I, if I you're originating you, yeah. on the New Orleans side, you can't get to it from the interstates or the expressway. Right. That's how <laughs> useful it is. Well, that's why they're looking to change it. So you're useless. over yeah. the West Bank right now. Oh. So we're, yeah, so this is above the Punch Train Expressway. I don't recall there even being this. Wow. Yeah, this, this, this would have been here in your lifetime. It definitely would have yeah. been there. I just don't recall it. Yeah. And I could see the double yellow down the middle. Or double yeah, white well, or yeah, I don't know what that was. So the, one of the things they are looking into doing with this is converting it into one lane each direction, um, which would allow 24-7 bus service on it. There's actually not that much that you would need to do to this to make it viable as a BRT corridor. So this curvature By the way, here's a, here's a money shot of the Superdome. Right here. Some of this, some of the curvature there seems like it would not be friendly for two buses to pass each other, so they'd have to eh, do something there. Th yeah, they would, but you'd be able to, yeah. Yeah, with one lane they could use the shoulders, with two lanes now I got issues. So the, if you follow this flyover all the way to the end, it dumps you onto Earhart Boulevard, which is underneath where the Pontchartrain Expressway meets Claiborne Avenue. So you like if you're coming from the West Bank, you have two choices. You can either take it all the way to the end here, or you can take the exit that was back there at the end of the superstructure at the convention center, and that takes you more to like the foot of Canal Street and like the downtown district proper. <clears throat> um. Okay. All right. So that was New Orleans. <clears throat> I actually want to ask you a serious question. Have there have, has there ever been a road meet in New Orleans? I wouldn't be the one to ask. So who would I ask about that? Um, people who like New Orleans include <laughs> Shondor. Um, well, yeah, because he has the LSU ties. Right? right. Yeah. And he's been around long enough that he would know if there's been one years ago, whereas, you know, I've never been to one, so I can't vouch for it. Yeah. Yeah, so, so he, here you go. Here is the I-55 coming in from the right around, off that ramp. Yeah. If, if you wanted to get to that, that, see, it's closed in this shot, but if you wanted to get to that ramp to 55 South from the local streets there, that would have been a little bit of a fun jump to make. Yeah. yeah. Yep, so <clears throat> this is the Memphis-Arkansas yeah. Bridge, which is part of I-55. Yeah, last time I drove 55, I came into it directly from the north to avoid having to deal with that interchange. Oh, so you came at it. You crossed the bridge in the other direction. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. Maybe I actually took 55 last time. Because 
No, I was, I was crunching I-40, so I'm assuming I took I-40, but I'm pretty sure I went down the waterfront of Little Rock from there on Riverside Drive. That would make the most sense. It was open. Yeah, if it was open, right. <laughs> Riverside Drive is never open. What are you talking about? There's, there's, I, I, as I think back on, I might not, because I might have taken 55 in and then circled around, because I know I've done 40 already. And so I was, I was trying to, so I might have actually done 55 east. I'm just going to call it east, because it's easier. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, this bridge is more east-west than north-south, right? Right. right. <clears throat> 40 and 55 parallel, they take you into two different downtowns, or the north and south sides of the actual downtown, so... Right. But you got a choice, depending on where you're going. Yeah, well, one, one of I-55's two crossings of the Mississippi River, this is the other thing here, is it... It's east of the Mississippi up to Memphis. It's then west of the Mississippi to St. Louis, and then east again to Chicago. Right, but that one—it's not crossing the I-55 bridge. Well, I-55 crosses the Mississippi twice. I think. Yeah, but the second one is the I-64 bridge. Mm. Yeah, there are there are multiple interstates on that bridge. Yeah. Well, only two of them now. Yeah. It used right. To be three. That's and, right. And 44 used to be signed there anyway. Is that, it was 44 signed on the bridge? If you were heading west, all four interstates were signed approaching the bridge. So I wonder if... Back then. Well, well, all right, but that was a missing two. 44 was never actually on no, that bridge. No, no. but now okay. that 44... That, that's, that's what I was going to ask. Now know. that 70 has been moved and 44 has been extended to it, you have no reason to sign more than two interstates. Yeah. <clears throat> so here is the great Mississippi River Bridge that was closed in 2021. And you have the uh, the Memphis Bass Pro Shops Pyramid off in the distance there. Which I really want to go to at some point. Yeah, well, like I said, like that's like the one thing in Memphis I haven't been to that I really want to get to. I've been to... Well, if you're in Memphis, you really should go to the National Civil Rights Museum, mm-hmm. which is in Memphis. Oh, uh, the, the Lorraine Motel? Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, go check out Beale Street. If you're into the music scene, you'll appreciate it more. Uh, but it's worth checking out either way. Um, the riverfront of Memphis is actually quite nice. It, it, it used to be kind of dumpy, but thanks to the never-ending construction on Riverside Drive, <laughs> it actually looks decent now. Um, there's, there's, there's a few different things to do if you're in Memphis. <clears throat> Ah, uh, jeez, what do we, uh, I know, we're, uh, we're three hours into this thing, so I'm gonna start to wrap this up soon, um, but I wanna get, I wanna at least get a couple more essentials on this show, video-wise. All of the bridges on the lower Mississippi River, um, the ones that I didn't already have on video, they are now all on video, and they were filmed in February 2023. All of these videos are now available on the YouTube channel for you to watch. So if there's a bridge that we don't cover in the video portion of the program, uh, don't worry. It's on YouTube. You can go and you can find all of them now uh, on the channel. So. Um, Did you swim across the river at the two locations of proposed bridges? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I wanted to clinch the I-69 alignment before. You could, you uh, could fly your drone across the bridge at the proposed location. I probably yeah, could. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You could do, yeah, as long as there's no airspace restriction. Yeah. Which there usually isn't at a place the bridge doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, unless there was some other reason. Yeah. Like near some sensitive site or something. <laughs> Yeah, I want to show you the Greenville Bridge eastbound so that you can see what I was alluding to before with how you can kind of see where the highway is supposed to go in the future once we once we touch down in Arkansas. Um, but as I also said earlier, this is a very long bridge considering that the river isn't isn't all that wide. I think the river is you, maybe... It, it's also not one of the two Huey P. long bridges. It's just a long bridge. <laughs> it's just a long bridge, yeah. <laughs> I think I think the river is only maybe four thousand feet wide. 
in most in most of its locations. But again, because you're spanning from levee to levee, you're dealing with a bridge that's well over two miles. So that's that's how you end up with the added construction cost and, and all that good stuff. <clears throat> People need places to drive their Chevys too. <laughs> <laughs> We are going to start to wrap up this show in a few minutes, so if people have any questions or comments on things that they've seen in this PowerPoint or things that they want our panel of engineers to <laughs> to address. <laughs> Roads that I intend to drive in the near future before they get built. Yeah, well, that too, yeah. Yeah, the weird thing about the, the Greenville Bypass is that it's all graded, and they built overpasses mm -hmm. over it, but they just never actually... <laughs> a goat path. It seems yeah. like they did the expensive and the hard parts. It, they, yeah. It's kind of like See, It path. says yeah. road closed, but all you have to do is just a, a little zoop right around it. Yeah, so you can see that's where the roadway is supposed to go, and that what they have in place right now was meant to be temporary. Join Alps Roads in an exclusive, you can't do this legally. <laughs> um, yeah, it's my understanding that this bridge long term is meant to serve as US 82. And the bypass, once it's built, would be signed as US 82. The long term plan is to sign US 278 on the I 69. The I 69 bridge, <laughs> yeah. So eventually, you know, like. Maybe Rainy will be a grandparent by the time this happens, but um, the Grainville Bridge will just be US 82 at some point in the future. I just took uh, it Street View on 454. Oh, we're going to Google Street View again, huh? There's no action. There doesn't appear. Marine really. Highway M55. Yeah. <laughs> well, right, which, yeah, I-55 I runs a lot along the Mississippi River, so the river is Marine Highway M55. Is that a coincidence, or did they actually... No, that is not a coincidence, that is... Really? Yeah. Okay. It didn't happen at the same time? You Well, yeah, you, you'll, you'll <laughs> notice if you look at... Um, at, like, because because the the Mississippi isn't the only river with a marine highway designation like that. There are others, and uh, the numbers do tend to, to fit like in the same grid as the interstate system. Mm. Let's see how they would do this. <clears throat> uh, first interchange with the unbuilt bridge. The existing eighty two two seventy eight would curve around into four fifty four, <laughs> and everything would just jump on and off there. That makes some sense. What I'm looking at is how to make this mine. So you remember how I was telling you about Grant's Canal when we were in Vicksburg? Um, the historic site that I showed you pictures of is basically right underneath the landing of this bridge on the Louisiana side of the river. So it would be more or less right beneath where we are. Like, here's the levee that we're about to cross over, but on the other side of the levee is where the Grants Canal site is. Hmm. So you just take the US-80 Delta exit off of I-20, and you just kind of find your way there, following the old US-80 alignment, of course. And that's how you'll get there. Okay, welcome to Louisiana. Bienvenue en Louisiana. Yeah. Does this count as being in the state? It's one of the few... Uh, Steve could pronounce that better than I could. Willkommen. <laughs> Different language. <laughs> Louisiana. I think the, the Louisiana welcome sign is one of the few that's bilingual, isn't it? Uh, I mean, I feel like... New, is New Mexico bilingual? I don't know That would have been my first choice, honestly. I don't know that New Mexico's actually is, but um, New Hampshire, I think, has some bilingual signs. You know what? That might be another one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, Vermont has bilingual signs, but 
Yeah, Vermont, I think Vermont does it with French. At least, certainly at the north end, they do it. Yeah. I think I think they have some. <clears throat> Maine is the one I'm not sure about because if you're entering Maine from Canada, that that is a dedicated effort. <laughs> yeah. I'll show you the cable state bridges and then we'll call it a night. How's that sound? So, I'll show you the Audubon Bridge here, which, as we've alluded to already, I had the roadway to myself mm. on this one. You're on the Audubon. Yeah, I could have driven it like I was, yeah. and nobody would have noticed. <laughs> cable sit, cable stay, cable good boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can see that they kind of took some inspiration from the Sunshine Skyway with this design. Well, with the yellow cables, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, that it's not in the medium. No, it's color-coded. Each of the yellow cables is intention. <laughs> yes. The ones that aren't yellow are not intention. That's how cables work. Yes, they're yes. intentional. Yes. <laughs> I hate those darn compression cables. <laughs> it's interesting also to note that with the Highway 10 approaches on both sides of this bridge, they are only built to two lanes wide. Yep. However, there is enough right of way that if for some reason traffic warrants it, they can just expand. They can build another parallel if politics two-lane roadway. It. Yeah, so like if you were to follow, I'm not going to show it on this video, but there there is space in the right-of-way for an, a parallel set of causeways and approach structures um, along the Highway 10 between uh, US-61 and... Um, uh, highway one, which is on the other side of the river. You know, it occurred to me with the drones, you could also fly some of these railroad bridges. Well, that's probably restricted. Uh, which which ones are you talking about? And, well, any of them, because you can't drive them, and if you can't walk them, maybe you could fly them. It would be inadvisable well, to fly the drone in a place where it could get hit by a train, but <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, it's better it, than yourself. Keep it a little higher up. If you know this, right, right. Well, for the purposes of photography, like you don't need to fly at a deck level to to do a proper photo documentation. And, and, unless you're making it sacrificial, but I mean <laughs> that gets expensive pretty quick. Well, I mean it's it's been done. Uh, uh, Ser Ser Serena Williams sacrificed a drone to determine for science how many shots it would take her to hit it, serving oh, yeah. it for the tennis racket. <laughs> she really did that. Uh, yeah, Randall Monroe actually asked her to for one of his books. <laughs> And she nice. did. How nice. many was it? <laughs> and she did it. It was less than ten, I think. I wouldn't expect it to yeah. be that much. She's a good player. I mean, I figured that I've she could hit this ramp before. I figured that she could hit anything with a tennis ball if she really wanted to. So well, this ramp is needlessly <laughs> excessive. That's there. But not shown in this video. If you pan to the right, you got a nice view of the bridge as you're going up the ramp. Yep. I think I stopped on the ramp briefly. <laughs> Oh, you're one of those people, huh? I, well, I let the people behind me go. <laughs> I, had, I had my own time there. Right, well, this, this is the thing. is I, I, I have no good photos of this bridge in spite of the fact that I have been over it three times because uh, the two times that I crossed it were in the same day and it was foggy as all hell. And the third time that I crossed it, it was after dark. Oh. So, oh. <laughs> so you have... Dark photos and you have nah, foggy photos. Yeah. Well, One, more photos One more time. One more time. All right, now we really have to have a New Orleans meet just right. so that this guy can get pictures of the bridge properly. I'm going to laugh so hard when you have a meet and it's foggy. Well, well, you know what? This picture was taken in early February, which is fog season in, down in southeast Louisiana. Right, and, well, and yeah, you remember how I mentioned in January 2020 and my experience with the rental car center in New Orleans Airport? That was the two foggy times. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, New Orleans is usually warm. It like south of the lake, it never gets below freezing, but it does get foggy because the water stays warm as the air temperature dips. More so in the morning, certainly. Yeah, there's a lot of morning fog in New Orleans in like December through February, but usually it burns off by midday, and you're still okay visibility wise. <clears throat> All right, well, I don't know, guys. I think you think we should wrap up. Laura, did you have... Um, Laura's gone. Yeah. Did Laura leave already? Laura, Laura hung up when we were in the HOV lanes. 
And you were in the, oh. uh, the SOB room. The, this is like <laughs> nicely put, Steve. Um, all right, well, I guess... Are there any bridges that we've missed that we want to show real quick? Uh, it doesn't take that long to show any given bridge, so... I guess it doesn't take that long, but uh, no, I think we I think we covered everything already. Um, it did clap on. I think we covered all the essentials, and as I said, the rest of these are available on the channel now. So the ones that, whether they were uploaded for the first time in 2017 or they've only just been filmed a few months ago, they're all uh, available on the channel for you to check out. So um, I would direct you folks there for more bridge-related footage. Um, is it true that Destrahan was named after a football player, and that's because the name comes from him? Destrahan. Well, I, I don't know what that even means, but okay. <laughs> uh, but I really want to thank... I know Laura's not here anymore, but I'm going to thank her anyway. Um, I want to thank Steve, yeah. and Erica, yeah. and Anthony. And yourself! Yeah, I, I did okay. <laughs> um, I really hope you enjoyed this journey down the Mississippi River. It, like I said, this was a fun show to do and to put together. And um, the subject matter, as I said, is one that has appealed to me for a long time. And I'm glad I finally got to do a show on it. So Yay. I'm glad that I got to do it. I hope you guys enjoyed uh, watching this. If you have not already done so, uh, please subscribe to the channel. Yay. For more webinars and other nonsense like this, uh, there will be plenty more shows like this in the future. Um, and hopefully you can join us for these whenever they come up. Yay. I hope you found this episode useful. Um, and we're going to sign off from here. Uh, for all my partners here tonight, uh, thank you all very much for watching. And we will catch you next time. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm.